we're really happy to have everybody coming in for this North America webinar for the IAG. As Susan said, this is the third year we've been doing this. And there, um, if you haven't noticed, there are webinars for never, basically every continent and parts of uh, some parts of other continents. <clears throat> I'm taking over as the, the North American representative um, for Alan James, who was a very good friend who passed away this last year. He was a good friend to many of us and a, a very important figure in the field as well, especially in um, sediments and in um, mining sediments, but in many other areas too. Uh, we have um, an eclectic group of speakers and I wanted the first year to have that eclectic uh, background so that uh, we can see a lot of different aspects of North America. We'll have a different group next year, we, um, we hope. And um, <clears throat> I've already got a number of people who said they couldn't do it this year, but who are willing to do it next year. So we should have a good turnout then too. <clears throat> My name is Tim Beach, by the way. I'm a professor at the University of Texas at Austin and in Washington, DC this year in a research center and um, uh, helped pull this, this um, webinar together with help from Susan. Um, great, well, thanks. Um everyone for tuning in uh, if it's early in your day or late in your day uh, especially thanks people if I guess it, if it's the mid part of your day thanks as well but maybe not quite as much if it's really early or if it's really late um, but I'm excited today to talk to you all about um, work we've been doing um, understanding uh, lake breach floods and and how this has uh, impacted the the Martian landscape um, and so since we're starting, um, you know, our, our, our North America session with a, a, a Mars talk, I thought I'd sort of set, up, set the stage for everyone. And, you know, when, when one conjures an image of Mars in their, their head, um, something like this is probably uh, what comes up, right? It's sort of dry, dusty, rocky place, right? Like if you've seen the, the movie The Martian, Matt Damon, very entertaining film, but it sort of depicts pretty reasonably the harsh, cold, dry environment of, of modern Mars. But if we look in the geologic record, what we see is actually an abundance of evidence for, for ancient um, water on, on the early surface of Mars. And so we think see things like fluvial valleys and paleo lakes, which is what I'm gonna be talking about today. We also see a wide, um, range of uh, sedimentary deposits laid down by fluvial activity. So here are some incised uh, valley fill deposits shown on the left and then in a distributary fan shown uh, on the right. Um, I'm going to be using the term ancient Mars or early Mars a lot um, throughout the talk or sort of that's the framework or the, the time period um, that I'm focused on for this talk. And so I think it's useful to set a stage of you know what that time period is. And so in the most sort of schematic way possible, this is a depiction of Mars's hydrologic evolution with time before present on the x-axis, modern on the right, going back in time um, in billions of years. And then sort of in the qualitative uh, y-axis here is, is um, fluvial activity. So think um, um, uh, abundance of fluvial systems or intensity of fluvial activity um, are sort of the, the, the qualitative descriptors there. Um, and the time period I'm going to be focused on today, this sort of early Mars time period, is right around the boundary between what we call the Noachian and the Hesperian eras, two major time periods in Mars's history. But really, you should keep this time period you know, sort of 3.7, 3.8 billion years ago is when we think there was peak fluvial activity on the surface of Mars. And some of the best evidence for fluvial activity that we see is branching valley systems, which are referred to as valley networks. And these record um, an environment of flowing surface water fed by um, surface runoff, uh, either direct precipitation or snow melts or perhaps groundwater discharge. I'm showing some example valley systems here. Um, so here's uh, just an image of what one of these valley systems looks like. And then on the uh, and then the sort of middle panel here is that valley system mapped out in red. Um, so you can see this branching dendritic ne um, valley network here. Here's another example where flow now is going to the top of the page, sort of two, two valleys um, joining up here. 
as a complement to the Valley Network record, um, we also see a record of, of surface water in, uh, in terms of paleo lake basins or ancient lake basins. These have been really well studied from orbit. I'm going to be talking to you about orbital satellite uh, data today. And this is an example of Gale Crater, which is, um, uh, we think, was a, a, a paleo lake basin and is the the site of exploration for the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity rover. Um, lakes, um, because of their interest, both in terms of sedimentology and astrobiology and biosignature -sign preservation potential, they've been really well studied in situ with rovers as well. And so MSL, um, the Curiosity rover has seen things like this in the middle panel, this fluvial conglomerate, or um, really nicely dipping um, sandstone um, beds that are interpreted as deltaic clinoforms. And so I'm going to be talking to you today is sort of about the interaction between valley systems and, and paleo lake basins. And I'm going to focus on hydrologically open lakes, which comprises the majority of the record of lake basins from, from early Mars's history. And so these are basins, uh, an example of which is shown on the right. I'm going to be showing a bunch of topography data um, throughout the talk, and I'm going to be using the same color ramp for all of these. And so to sort of key your eye in blue colors, deeper blues are low elevation, and then that moves up through green, and then yellow and white are the highest elevations. And what we have here is a topographic low on the landscape with inlet valleys flowing into that in a single outlet canyon that drains up to the northwest. And this topographic configuration tells us that water must have ponded in the interior of the basin supplied by these inlet valleys before breaching the confining topography, which is pretty much always, although not exclusively defined by crater rims. And as the, the confining topography was breached, this outlet canyon was incised and connected the interior of the basin with the exterior terrain. And past work has indicated that this fill and breaching of these Paleo Lake basins was catastrophic and that this outlet canyon uh, incision was very, very rapid. So these, these rapid catastrophic events that reshape the landscape. And when we look at Paleo Lake outlet canyon, so here's one example, I'm showing uh, another example here, uh, Medim Vallis on the right, which is um, one of the most, if uh, one of the most, if not the most, impressive fluvial systems on the surface of Mars. Um, it's like 10 to 15 kilometers wide, over a kilometer deep, uh, almost a thousand kilometers long. So an incredibly impressive valley or really canyon system that was formed when the Eridania Paleo Lake Basin, which is shown over here in this black contour, this is the outline of that Paleo Lake Basin, um, as that basin filled up and breached its confining topography, it catastrophically and rapidly incised Medim Vallis here through, through a very high discharge event, analogous to uh, glacial lake outburst floods we have on, on Earth. Um, and so these canyons, when we look at them individually, are incredibly impressive in some of the most impressive canyon systems we see on Mars. But when people think about and talk about sort of the global scale fluvial valleys and the hydrologic cycle on Mars, typically it's inferred that these Paleo Lake outlet canyons are isolated sort of one-off features, impressive, but not sort of representative of anything larger. And instead, these branching fluvial valley systems are, are, are typically interpreted as recording protracted flows as sort of an integral part of the Martian hydrologic cycle, drawing much analogy with Earth's hydrologic cycle, right? Where we have precipitation on the landscape that drives surface runoff that collects into these um, channelized flows in the valleys. That flow excavates sediment from the valley, carving a large valley that water makes it to some terminal sink, an ocean or a large lake basin, and then that cycles through the climate and precipitates out again, where over protracted periods of time, as you move water through these valley systems, you erode deep valleys over, over long periods of time through this hydrologic cycling. And in this sort of framework, right, Paleo Lake outlet canyons that form rapidly are very distinct but are typically assumed to be isolated features. 
um, sort of not a, you know, representative of some global process. Um, and so the talk, the work I'm going to present to you today is, is um, asking whether that's a reasonable assumption or, or asking whether it's a good assumption to think that Paleo Lake Outlet Canyons are indeed isolated features, not of global importance. And I'm going to test this, try and test this assumption by asking this question, well, how much did lake breach flooding contribute to fluvial erosion on early Mars, right? Was it a very minuscule fraction or was it a, an appreciable amount? And, and that will give us a sense of how important this process is for reshaping the Martian landscape. So this is the question we're gonna try and go after. And our approach sort of um, is, has three, uh, three steps to it. First, we take catalogs, uh, previously compiled catalogs uh, based on topography uh, and geomorphology of uh, fluvial valleys across the surface of Mars. We then look at every valley segment and every valley segment that starts at a lake basin gets classified as a paleo lake outlet. Everything else is classified as a, as a valley network, which presumably formed from some um, type of surface runoff. Um, so that's the first step. We sort of classify all these valley segments. We then um, subset our data to remove, there are some valleys that form later in Mars history. And so we remove all of the valleys on, on sort of terrain that is younger than that Noachian Hesperian transition, younger than that 3.7, 3.8 billion year time frame. So we remove all of those valleys. We also remove valleys that are poleward of, uh, of 30 degrees north and south. Um, because these have, have typically been modified by a, a more recent glacial activity. Um, so these are the masks we apply to our data, although as it turns out in our final results, uh, which mask you apply doesn't actually affect the, the final result, which I'll show in just a second. So now we have this, this catalog of valley segments in two classes. We then use global Mars topography derived from orbital laser altimetry. And we compare that with a progressive black top hat transformation, which is a, an algorithm developed by Wei Lo and colleagues that allows us to automate the depth of each valley segment. So it uh, is fed in the global topography as well as this, um, this, this um, catalog of valley segments, and it outputs a depth map for all of those valleys. And so from this, we can sum over our two categories and get a total excavated volume for Paleo Lake outlets and for valley networks. And so these two numbers, right, it's just going to be two numbers that we're going to compare, right, the total volume excavated by um, valley networks and the total volume excavated as Paleo Lake outlets. This is going to allow us to answer our question, which is how much do outlets contribute to fluvial incision? Um, and the answer to that question is a lot. Um, and that's kind of best summarized in, right, it's just two numbers, so we can summarize it very simply in a, in a pie chart, which is shown in the lower left here, which is the proportion of total eroded volume um, uh, contributed by Paleo Lake outlets in blue and Valley networks in black. And what we see is that outlet canyons represent about a quarter of the total eroded volume of fluvial valleys on Mars. So they're not the dominant um, contributor to erosion, but they're also not a small fraction. They're a significant fraction of the total erosion accomplished on early Mars's landscape. We also see if we look at a, a cumulative distribution plot where we're plotting depth of all the valley segments on the x-axis, this is in a log scale, we see that Paleo Lake outlets are significantly deeper, deeper, again in this blue curve, which is shifted to the right from the valley network black curve. Paleo Lake outlets are a factor of about two deeper on average than valley networks. So, so they're, they're much deeper than these, these fluvial valley system or these, these surface runoff bed valley systems. And so these results tell us that, you know, lake breach flooding is not just an isolated um, uh, process, but really it's a process of global importance, right? It's contributing a quarter of the erosion we see. And so we can't always assume that these lake outlets are anomalies and that valleys record this sort of protractic hydrologic cycling. And I'm going to argue that I think this actually makes sense when we consider what the Martian landscape looks like at a larger scale. Um, what I'm showing here is topographic data from Mars on the left, continental North America, so fitting this webinar uh, on the right. Um, and these data are shown with the same spatial scale, so same scale bar, 
also with the same amount of relief in the color bar. So the same amount of topography is expressed in these data. And what you can see is that the structure of the topography is extremely different between the Earth and Mars. On Mars, we have slopes that are continuously interrupted by craters. So these long wavelength slopes are interrupted by craters at pretty much all length scales. And these craters act as sites where water can pond and then catastrophically breach. And so for in the last couple of minutes here, I just want to talk through, you know, what does this actually mean? What does this result mean for broader Martian landscape evolution? Um, and if we think about lake breach floods on Earth, um, uh, lake breach floods are often suggested as, as one important mechanism for initially integrating a landscape of, of basins that are disconnected. A classic example is the basin and range topography. So here I'm showing a map in uh, North America with um, basin spillover events mapped in these, these red diamonds. You can see they're concentrated in this basin and range province um, in, the, in the Southwest. Um, and I think that the basin and range is a really decent topographic analog for Mars with all of these numerous disconnected crater basins. And so since we have the preserved prominence of lake breach floods as this really important process, it suggests to us that Mars fluvial valley systems are, are immature. They, they never fully integrated the landscape. Um, and this is consistent with a lot of past work suggesting um, immature fluvial valleys on Mars. One of the key signatures pointed to for this is that Mars valleys, the long profiles of them, I'm showing an example in the lower left here, typically are not concave. They are rather linear or have these convexities in them. And drawing analogy with mature fluvial valley profiles shown from model output on the right, showing this beautiful concave profile as where slope decreases as you go downstream. And so drawing an analogy between these two, it's typically been interpreted that fluvial, um, the, the, the convexity of fluvial systems on Mars tell us something about the formative Martian hydroclimate, something like there was not enough water, uh, water was around for, for, for not long enough, something like that. But another way that you can create convex immature valleys is by perturbing the system uh, boundary conditions, like through a rapid Outlet Canyon incision. And we can see direct evidence of that where this Outlet Canyon here has a tributary flowing into it. And that tributary is actually a hanging valley with massive convexity as the tributary flows into the Paleo Lake Outlet. And this is just one small example, but if we zoom up to the landscape scale, we see that Outlet Canyons are widely integrated into most Martian Valley systems. And so as these Outlet Canyons rapidly incised, nearby fluvial systems would have to respond, offering us an alternative explanation for the lack of valley concavity on Mars. And so with that, I'll put my conclusions up and, uh, and I'll end there to stay on time and leave a bit of time for questions in case there are any. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, bon dia, buenos dias, uh, depending where you are. Uh, Carlos Ramos Sharon, um, as they mentioned, uh, affiliated with the uh, Department of Geography and the Environment, but also Latin American Studies and also a courtesy appointment with the Department of History. Um, and as Dorothy would say, we're not in Mars anymore, and then we still haven't made it to uh, North America. So uh, my talk is mostly going to be by the U.S. Caribbean or Northeastern Caribbean, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands and that related to the topic of sediment budgets and the importance of roads in driving the sediment budgets. Before I fully begin with my presentation, I just want to uh, make a comment uh, that we are all geomorphologists or enthusiasts right, in, uh, 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 in geomorphology. Uh, but sometimes, right, we tend to work on our silos. Um, and I come from the geosciences. I, I did my, my undergraduate degree and my, my PhD are uh, both in geology. Um, and an example of that, I think Tim just spoke today, it might be like 100 meters away from me, and I don't think we have met. <laughs> so, but also in terms of our traditions, right, uh, uh, in, in, and what we read, right? And, um, um, I just want to start off with uh, with uh, Carl Sauer, right? I, I did a uh, uh, spent a couple of years in uh, Berkeley, and the Department of Geography was what two flights above uh, where I, uh, I spent a lot of time. Carl wasn't there when I when I arrived, but 
uh, I was totally unaware. I was totally unaware of the of the type of work uh, that was being done in terms of landscapes uh, uh, in in the Department of Geography, right? And, and for me, um, I encountered uh, Carl Sauer's work through a friend that's actually an anthropologist, not even a geographer, right? And and this this quote is for me is really formidable and, and it drives a lot of what I do, right? So landscape is a land shape in which the process of shaping is by no means thought of simply physical, okay? So this is a uh, thinking, and this is kind of defining what geography is back in the uh, early 20th century. Um, nowadays, right, uh, and, and, and again, this is something that has carried on with, uh, with uh, geography very explicitly, um, but within the framework of critical physical geography, uh, I'm gonna quote here a good friend and a colleague, uh, Michael Urban, uh, in defense of crappy landscapes, and, and he's provoking people, right, about, calling a landscape crappy, but um, uh, in, in this paper, he uh, basically, he wants to say, why, why don't we study uh, these landscapes that are uh, uh, profoundly impacted by humans as much as we do with natural and what we call natural environments, right? So, so my talk is basically about crappy uh, landscapes in the Caribbean. So we know soil erosion is a, is a function of uh, different factors, climate, topography, uh, lithology, but also human impacts, right? And this is something that is that is not new. Uh, deforestation, right, uh, that removes vegetation, which provides cover for, for the soils, but also through the process of deforestation and, and, and land use, uh, the soil is compacted, so you increase the chances of uh, Hortonian overland flow, right? You exceed, uh, rainfall exceeds the capacity of uh, infiltration. Uh, and then also the likelihood of soil erosion. And then deforestation can occur uh, in a variety of, for, for a variety of reasons, right? So it depends on location, time, and period. Uh, just my examples that I have here, uh, you can see deforestation most likely somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, right? For the purposes of timber harvesting, uh, um, in this case here, agriculture, and here, uh, uh, urbanization, right, or development for uh, living conditions. So crappy landscapes in the historic Caribbean, what are you talking about, right? I go there, I've been there, it's so green, it's so beautiful, waters are great, right? Let's shadow that uh, that, that uh, idea, right? It doesn't matter where you go in the Caribbean, in the insular Caribbean, uh, the landscapes have undergone very severe dramatic changes, okay? Um, Dating back to the to the 17th century, okay, uh, what is called in the environmental history um, literature the clay, the Great Clearing. Uh, here, an example from Barbados. Okay, this is Barbados in 16 in the 1650s. Um, the island was settled in 1627. By that time, there's barely any tree left on the entire island. Okay, um, and this is sort of what the island looked like in undergoing that transformation. Okay, so totally humanized landscape. Uh, if you look closely, yes, uh, there's a couple of camels actually in Barbados. Of course, camels are not native to Barbados, right? So the humans actually enforcing changes not only on the, on the landscape as a whole, right? The soils, topography, vegetation, but also the fauna and the purposes of that land as well. And it doesn't matter which island you go, right? This is an example from the US Virgin Islands, the island of St. John. Uh, Barbados was a, a British colony. This was a Danish colony, okay? And then each island had its own pattern of, of developing, right? But they're, they're mostly, right, um, uh, sugar factories, sugar plantations, right? And this is a very formidable map uh, uh, from almost the peak of uh, maybe 20 years before the peak of sugar, um, uh, production in, in the island of St. John. Um, and this is how part of the landscape and what we see in here is actually part of this. Uh, so this plantation here is most likely this one over here. And then the case of, uh, of Puerto Rico, um, we don't have the luxury of that beautiful map, right? But uh, we can actually peek to the landscape through many different eyes, right? We can go through, um, um, we can go through uh, historical documentation, uh, but also we can we can uh, literally, in this case, uh, peek through the windows of paintings, right? This is El Velorio, probably Puerto Rico's uh, most famous uh, uh, painting. 
Uh, Francisco Ayer was one of the impressionists, uh, uh, actually uh, trained in France. And then we look at, if we look outside, uh, we can see that the landscape is not forested at all. Okay, uh, this is in the 1890s. Another chance that we can see this, 1905. Okay, another very famous uh, painting uh, from Puerto Rico, El Pan Nuestro, our daily bread. And then if we look behind the character there, we can see that there's no resemblance of any tropical forest, right? Um, maps, um, this is this one's date, dating from 1899. Uh, this is kind of a, a view of what Puerto Rico could be or the potential, right? It's called a land use map, but not everything was, was used for agriculture. We have uh, areas prone to coffee production in brown, in yellow, combination of bananas, oranges, and whatnot, and then the potential for sugar and everything that's green. So the, the basic point here is that this view, right, that's being enforced in this case by somebody from the US uh, Geological Survey, that every piece of land uh, is worth, uh, uh, is, is worth uh, using by, by humans, okay? The, the use and overuse of the land led to uh, some initial attempts to document the impacts of that uh, of, of those practices in, in erosion. Okay, so at some point in time, very early, right, uh, mid uh, uh, 20th century, Puerto Rico had the luxury of a very sophisticated uh, soil erosion lab. Okay, we we have none of the capacities there anymore. Okay, uh, really important data collected for the purposes of. Uh, the revised universal soil equation and, and all that. Um, but a lot of this was driven by, by the need to sustain crops, right? So this was uh, mostly driven by um, agronomists. And we missed the opportunity early on, right? Uh, to actually tap into another, um, uh, another field that was also studying uh, um, uh, erosion processes elsewhere that would have been helpful back then in terms of uh, uh, understanding erosion processes. And that's all the work that was being done out west, while Puerto Rico's quite a ways from, uh, from Idaho and, and, and the Western states, right? So this whole tradition, right? Uh, the study of studying the impacts of, of roads on, on sediment budgets uh, back in the 60s and 70s. And, and of course, right, Leslie Reed's and, and Tom Dunn's work on, on, uh, on forest roads in Washington, and then the work by uh, Tom and Bill in, um, in Africa, actually, on um, recognizing the importance of, of uh, Bay Roads. So it wasn't until the late 90s that we started, people started studying uh, uh, erosion processes related to roads in the Caribbean. So it took three decades. Uh, in order for that culture uh, and that literature to actually make it and, and, and develop uh, uh, some interest in terms of studying these processes in, in the Caribbean. Uh, one of the first works was done by, uh, by my advisor, Lee McDonald, um, in the island of St. John, and then also Matt Larson studying landslides in the Lukija Experimental Forest and making spatial associations between roads and, and the currents of landslides. Okay, so the view changes, right? The, the needs for, for studying erosion are different from what they were in the mid 20th century in Puerto Rico, right? Mostly agriculture, but then there's also downstream effects. Okay, what sort of downstream effects are we talking about? Okay, two examples here, um, the filling of reservoirs, okay? If you can believe it, right? There's a dam here. This used to be a lake, okay? Uh, probably built in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, walk that creek now and there's no trace of a lake whatsoever very high sediment yields, so totally unexpected. The life expectancy of this, of this lake, uh, 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 I can't remember what it was, but I say it was uh, 75 years and the lake, actually had, the, the lake actually lasted like 30. Okay, so our incapacity to actually uh, predict uh, accurately um, erosion rates and sediment yield rates, it's, uh, it's, it's causing a problem with, uh, with uh, a water storage capacity in Puerto Rico, about 30, to 35% of the water storage capacity for the island is actually compromised uh, because it uh, has sediments in it, okay? And then another um, uh, reason to do this work in the Caribbean downstream effect are, are the impacts on corals. Corals uh, tend to thrive under oligotropic conditions, low nutrients, uh, high transparency, 
and then sediments um, are actually one of the main uh, factors uh, responsible for the decline of um, of coral reefs throughout the Caribbean. So what have we studied? We've studied uh, on paid roads, on paid roads on, on the island of St. John. We've studied foot trails, we've studied uh, uh, off-road vehicle trails, and then uh, roads in coffee farms in the central western part of Puerto Rico. Just a layout here, U.S. Virgin Islands, St. Thomas, St. John, St. Croix. These are two islands that belong to Puerto Rico, sometimes called um, the Spanish uh, Virgin Islands, Culebra and Vieques. This is where the Navy had a, a, a bombing range. Actually, Culebra had one as well. And then uh, some areas in the dry tropics here in Southwest Puerto Rico, La Parguera and Cabo Rojo, and then the coffee uh, work that we have done uh, in Central Puerto Rico. This is how the landscapes look. You can see, right, mostly in septisols, very shallow soils here, uh, ephemeral streams, Okay, less than a thousand millimeters per year, and then in wet tropical conditions in, in western central Puerto Rico, totally different landscape. The vegetation is uh, reflecting that, right, from cacti to really uh, tropical, lush tropical uh, rainfall um, uh, forests, and then and then really high uh, rainfall rates, and then totally different um, soil types as well. Okay, and then what, one of the things that, that's important here, um, and, and this is a reflection of only this part of Puerto Rico, the western uh, wetter part of Puerto Rico, right? Sediment yields are very high. We're talking about 500 to 4,000 uh, tons per square kilometer per year, right? And how are those, and those have been sustained for decades, right? So the question is how, how, how has that happened? Puerto Rico underwent its phase of deforestation started in the in the uh, mid 19th century, okay, all the way into the U.S. transition in 1899. Okay, Puerto Rico used to be a Spanish colony. Uh, uh, the U.S. takes over in 1898. Sugar production uh, accelerates. Coffee production starts to dwindle a little bit. But the peak, right, at some point in time, uh, 1930s or so about 80 something percent of Puerto Rico was deforested, okay? And nowadays, uh, Puerto Rico has undergone a really dramatic reforestation phase. So how do you sustain sediment yields uh, at, 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 with these values uh, as the landscape is actually healing, right? Or, or, or recovering from, from uh, human disturbance, okay? What drives disturbance in the Caribbean? Tourism is, is a big driver, right? People want their views. People want to spend time in this uh, in this landscape. So therefore, you develop, and in order for you to develop and, and provide access, you build roads. Okay, uh, just the thrill of of uh, adventure, right? Uh, this is a, a very common activity in Puerto Rico. Unfortunately, it's it's a, it's a mostly unregulated. Um, and but then you you look right. You want to use that topography and that wetness of the soil, right, to to provide you a thrill. So that's uh, another reason for for disturbance, okay, and also for uh, economic interest, okay, agriculture. But also let's tie this up to culture and tradition, and this is really important. Um, uh, people in Puerto Rico are very very proud of their coffee. Okay, I'm one of those, right, and and you can see it in in cultural expressions, right. Uh, these two singers and salsa. Um, musicians from the 1960s, right, singing to to praising coffee, um, and then the latest phenomenon, Puerto Rico, right. If you don't know, this is a bad bunny, uh, a cultural phenomenon, not only Puerto Rico but worldwide. Okay, 18.5 billion streams in Spotify in 2022. There's no way that your morphologists will ever get that sort of attention, right? Um, and the reason why I bring back Bad Bunny here is that the first time that we was given a chance to actually uh, do a deal with Adidas about some shoes, what theme did he choose? He chose coffee. Okay, so you see, right, and he's always very proud of, of his Puerto Rican heritage, right? Um, uh, so um, coffee is not going to go away in Puerto Rico, even though in, in many instances it's economically illogical. People are losing money because they're growing coffee, but they, farmers feel a need to maintain that tradition, okay? In case you're interested and you were, uh, your shoe size is 10, this goes for, these are going for $3,000, okay? So it gives you, you know, what, what money means nowadays culturally to the world. 
So this this landscape is not going to go away. Okay. Uh, even though coffee production in Puerto Rico nowadays is is just nothing compared to what it was, um, these humanized landscapes are not going to go away. So this is an example of a road, especially in the coffee farmers in Puerto Rico, right? So this is what I'm calling a crappy uh, uh, feature, right? Crappy, crappy landscape uh, by uh, by uh, the presence of roads. So roads, right? Uh, very uh, well compacted surface here, uh, unvegetated, used by traffic, generates a lot of runoff. Also, you have the cut slope, okay, collapsing and producing a lot of runoff as well. So that's one of the effects on, of, uh, of roads in, in, um, in sediment budgets, but then roads can actually also alter the, 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 the pathways of water and sediment, right? So in this case, every one of those points uh, is a drainage point. That's where road uh, runoff is actually being diverted. Uh, and you can see that the road is capturing the runoff and the sediment is actually just reconnecting into some uh, Piracy, right? That if you wish, right? This this uh, should drain this way, and now it's actually draining into a different subcatchment. So very complex type of uh, landscape that we're talking about here. So what are the methods at the at the point scale, at the very small scale, right? Uh, and, and in terms of understanding the impact of roads and on runoff production, and our main goal here is horizontal overland flow. Okay, well per parameters, plots, rainfall simulation. Okay, and on a larger scale plumes, press gauges, and also places that we actually measure uh, stream gauge and stream discharge. So what are the results? Okay, uh, in, the, in, the, in the vertical axis here, it's either infiltration capacity, so that's all the bars, or rain intensity, that's the lines, okay? Dry tropical settings, natural um, uh, soils, okay, in septic soil, and then these are the natural soils in green also for the wet uh, areas. Infiltration capacity for road, just a fraction of what is naturally an abandoned road, okay? Recapturing some of that capacity, but not quite close to uh, natural. And then uh, off-road vehicles, okay? So the bottom line here is that roads, the infiltration capacity of roads leads to a very frequent uh, production of portal overland flow, and that does not occur naturally. And the same thing in, um, but even more pronounced in, uh, in the wet areas of Puerto Rico, right? Uh, a much higher infiltration capacity of natural soils, the cultivated land, right? The, where you grow the coffee, okay? Also shows an impact of uh, compaction, okay? Uh, um, infiltration capacity is in the range of about 50 uh, millimeters per hour. And then the roads, uh, just a fraction of that, about 10. So again, a lot of the runoff, uh, generated by uh, by the roads themselves. And then we also right, to want to expand that, not only the local impacts, but the down downstream impacts. We use what is called the uh, volume to breakthrough concept. It was developed by um, Jackie Croak and, and uh, people in Australia. Very similar to cost analysis uh, uh, type of uh, deal in GIS, okay? So basically how much runoff can do you need to add to the landscape to advance a meter down slope? Okay, and then we, we use this to try to map right, the, the flow pathways and, and what kind of event is actually going to uh, uh, produce uh, enough runoff so that uh, delivery of runoff and sediment occurs on, on the coastal areas. Okay, so we have the metrics here. Uh, bottom line is that naturally, in, and this is in the dry tropics, the watersheds sheds uh, runoff into coastal waters only about four times per year. Okay, remember coastal waters here, you have the coral reefs. So that's really important. That's why, that's why the corals are there <laughs> because it's so rare that they can actually deal with those uh, uh, disturbances and, and, then, and then recuperate in between. But the roads can actually increase the frequency of, uh, of uh, delivery up to 40 times, right? The tenfold increase in the capacity of this watershed actually to shed Runoff into the into the the coastal area in terms of the frequency of con of connectivity. Okay, the wet tropics. We better, was, we better yes. wrap it up here. I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay, no problem. Okay, I share your fascination with these roads, though, and erosion. <laughs> so, so in terms of erosion, right? Increasing in, in erosion rates up to ten thousand times above natural rates. Okay, so a very significant impact. Okay. 
uh, and even much higher capacity to produce sediment and contribute to sediment budgets than actually the cultivated land. Okay, so that's what these uh, these uh, um, graphs are showing. Okay, about ninety percent of the sediment production by surface erosion is happening because of the of the uh, of of the roads. Okay, very high road densities, forty four kilometers per square kilometer. It's uh, that's that's uh, rarely seen on any landscape. Okay, and then. Um, how do you account for um, so much, uh, such a high sediment yield um, with only nowadays only five to 15% of the watershed is uh, uh, actually 8% of the watershed being covered by cropland? Okay. The answer has to do with landslides. Okay. And we saw an, a, a, an event where landslides were um, uh, uh, occurred. This was Hurricane um, uh, Maria in, in 2017. We had the capacity to, to measure this. We had a lighter before the event and a lighter after the event. So we're actually not only to map the landslides, but also um, um, get an estimate of the volume that's actually mobilized. Okay, And basically the, the bottom line here, you can see right the humanized landscape, every yellow line there is a, is a road. And then the roads uh, are actually producing most of the, of the, of the landslides. I and mean, it doesn't matter if the road is active or inactive. Okay, a lot of the of most of the sediment that was coming from uh, that was generated from these landscapes was coming from what is currently forested land. But underneath, okay, there's still the road network that's a legacy from uh, uh, previous cropland use. Okay, so ninety percent of the sediment is actually coming out from within 10 meters of the road network, okay? So just as a, as, a, as a summary, really important impacts in hydrology, really important impacts in surface erosion, but most importantly, it's also uh, the, the impact of roads on, on landsliding, which is kind of the main uh, sediment source in these areas. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you for the time. And, um, I don't know if it's time for questions, but if not, I'll yeah. be happy to take them. Yeah. Okay, um, thanks so much. It took me a second there to find that unmute button. Okay, so uh, so yeah, so now we're on North America's continent, and we worked our way here from Mars. And uh, I think this is a strongly North American story. I have sort of a double, uh, you know, a kind of a pun in this in this talk, but it's one that's intentional because I actually think for North America's rivers, it is important to look at organismal effects in terms of the geomorphic evolution of rivers. Okay, and I think here in the Sipsi River, where I've been working with ecologists and students for a while, we have some good evidence in support of that idea. And so the overarching question is: Are we missing? An an important part of how and why rivers in North America evolve by neglecting to include um, organisms in, in terms of our geomorphic frameworks. Ecologists monitor the work of organisms, geomorphology, geomorphologists study the geomorphic processes, but if we can merge those observations together, particularly for certain key organisms, we might yield new insights into why rivers meander. And that's really kind of what I'm focusing on here. I'm going to be presenting today a lot of data from previous students' projects. And so I have Greg Schaefer's master's thesis, Matt Kerner's master's thesis. I have QR codes embedded in the talk. So if you're interested in finding out more detailed information about the methods, which I'm really just going to kind of fly through today for brevity's sake, um, please use those QR codes to access our theses. We're currently working in, um, on putting those into, into production as, as manuscripts. And then all of the, the uh, muscle data that I'm going to show you today are uh, data gathered by Dr. Carla Atkinson, who's a muscle ecologist here at the University of Alabama, and her students. Okay, So with those caveats, um, I'm going to go ahead and get going here. So why the Sipsi River? Well, maybe you don't know this, but Alabama is a hugely biologically diverse place. North America holds the largest population of mussels in the world. Most of those mussels exist today in the southeastern United States. And within the Sipsi River, there's over 60% of the population of mussels. So it, it's really... Um, 
I'm sorry, it's, uh, sorry, there's 61% of North America's mussel species are represented in, in Alabama. The SIPSI itself has 42 different species, which is hugely biologically diverse, especially considering the effects of river regulation, as well as other land use disturbances caused by humans over time. And so it remains sort of this outlier and unique river system in terms of its preservation of its uh, mussel community. It's uh, also super species uh, diverse population up to 36 species that live in the aggregations within the river beds. And so you'll hear me talk about these aggregations as communities sometimes or sometimes um, as aggregations. I mean the same thing. The interesting thing about mussels that I didn't know before starting this work is that they really kind of live and function on spatial and temporal scales relevant to geomorphology. So they actually can live up to a century, depending on the species. Most of them, it's within the range of decades. And they live in these very, very dense aggregations, which means they're distributed everywhere within river bottoms. You may not perceive it when you're walking in the channel and waiting because they tend to burrow. And so sometimes they're lying beneath the surface. But in the Sipsi River, uh, even today, even though we've lost some of our populations, we can find them in dense aggregations of 20 to 40 individuals per square meter. So if there is a river situation with, with which to um, look at these questions about biogeomorphic interactions and how that informs lateral migration processes and other geomorphic processes, the SIPSI is as good as it gets today. Um, so within the SIPSI River, we're actually going to limit our scope to the lowermost section. This is because this is where the highest density of mussel organisms actually reside. And uh, they actually occur throughout the whole river system. They just have the highest populations in the lowermost part. They've been studied since the 1900s by ecologists. And some of these studies are more qualitative, some are very quantitative. And so I'm presenting to you some quantitative population estimates um, for some of the sites that we'll be talking about today. We're just calling them sites one through four um, in the lowermost section of the river. <laughs> sites one through three are places where we've made geomorphic measurements. Site four was basically uh, included in a larger kind of segment scale study that I'll talk about towards the end of the talk. But we made a lot of actual measurements at sites one through three. But here you can see quite substantial population numbers, not anything like you would see anywhere else really. The SIPSI is kind of special in this regard. And so what you can see is that the populations can be in excess of 40,000 uh, within individual reaches. And so ecologists for a really long time have been studying how org muscle organisms actually modify their physical environment to their liking. And they do a lot of this through burrowing, uh, which basically allows them to move from surface to subsurface and carry their effects with them. But when they are at the surface, they have been shown to basically uh, provide resistance to flow. They actually slow down velocity as a result of that. And uh, when they're at the surface, they can also shelter smaller particles. And so again, protecting sediment from entrainment. And then when they actually excrete mucus and feces, they can bioconsolidate sediment. And that increases the, the diameters of particles that are in a, found in association with them. So these have long been documented by ecologists, these effects, but primarily in flume studies. And so our question and motivation became, can we measure these same kind of processes in a real river with real muscle communities? And so um, we're gonna start that story. It's basically gonna be covered in three acts at the patch scale. And so I'm showing you the QR code for the, the thesis that kind of corresponds to these data because we wanted to see, okay, right where the muscles are living, what are they doing to sediment? Okay, so the big take home from this research was that it seems that the effects of the muscles on the particle size distributions and the sorting would actually equate to a 55% reduction in bed load transport during bank full flow conditions. So we measured the sediment particle characteristics before and after a 13 week in stream manipulation experiment where we built these mussel enclosures and we seeded them with two different species of mussels in different uh, densities. And you can kind of see the factorial design of the research over here. So the ecologists were asking questions about species differences. We were really looking more at density effects, but uh, we monitored scour using these uh, scour bead approach. 
And we did this in this reach um, all throughout about a 60 meter section. Um, and so each of these uh, enclosures is about a square meter. And we quantified particle size changes pre and post treatment um, using a variety of approaches, but primarily using essentially ImageJ to take uh, photographs that captured surface characteristics of uh, particle diameter, okay? And so that information basically yielded these results where we actually found that where we have higher muscle densities, the D50 was actually coarser, it was larger. And higher muscle density enclosures were, were associated with more sorting, essentially better sorting than uh, enclosures that didn't have any muscles in them at all. I don't know if you noticed in the experimental design, we actually had some enclosures that were empty and we had some with dead muscles. And so most of these effects that I'm talking about were between the ones that have high density muscle enclosures and no muscles or the sham muscles. And uh, there were some species driven differences. For example, there was a little spell of, of scour that happened probably from the muscles burrowing. And that seemed to be very species dependent. And so the spatial pattern of that scour is actually pretty, um, not necessarily random, but it's associated with where certain species, the high burrowing species tended to be. And so, uh, so overall, we can see that they're causing the, the bed to actually be coarser, and they're probably overall adding to some of the armoring of the bed um, as, as a result of that coarsening of the surface uh, sediment sizes, okay? So once we got these results, we thought, okay, they at a very micro scale, they're altering sediment characteristics. As we know, sediment characteristics help set the stage for channel morphology changes through time and other reach scale processes. Um, and so we decided to take another step and investigate whether or not we could measure changes in bank erosion processes that could be associated with these changes in sediment properties. Because again, we felt overall the bed is becoming more stable because the muscles are coarsening the surface material, probably sheltering them with their presence during higher flows. Um, and as a consequence of that, we think that the sediment flux is actually being reduced during start larger discharges. So we undertook a 10 week monitoring experiment where we actually measured both muscle densities at a one uh, square meter scale. And then everywhere where you see an X, we did bank uh, erosion monitoring using pins. And we did this for the whole duration of the experiment once a week. And then we actually did, we had two very high flow events during this uh, monitoring phase. And we actually uh, checked right after those events to take advantage of that. And so what we found overall is that bank erosion was highest at the highest density muscle site, which was site two. And so uh, this site was statistically different than the others. The others have, a, a, well, what would be considered a pretty high density of muscles for most other rivers in the range of 10 to 14 individuals per square meter. But site two really has a very high density. So in the range of 20 to 40 individuals per square meter. And it was very, it was statistically different to the others, we believe as a consequence of this. So we actually used a stepwise linear regression model to see what of the all of the different bank erosion properties we measured and muscle density characteristics helped explain the variation in bank erosion processes. And just using three bank erosion properties, the bank height, the bank uh, protection status, and bank angle characteristics combined with um, the muscle density data, we basically had eight or greater than 80% of the variation of the bank erosion data explained. Of that variation, about 30% is explained by the muscle density alone. So this is a statistically significant relationship. And so they're not driving the bank erosion entirely, but they are associated with it, um, it seems, in terms of being able to predict the occurrence of bank erosion and its severity. So from the REACH perspective, we felt like we had a pretty convincing line of evidence that showed that the muscles are altering the sediment, the bed sediment to make them more stable and harder to transport. And, um, and then that is having consequences for the location of erosion downstream and within the reach. And so we decided to take a big picture approach and look at segment scale changes um, in the river itself. And so what we did to do this was an, actually a very large 48 kilometer segment of the lower portion of the Sipsi River that incorporated our four um, sites that I showed you before. And essentially what we we're trying to do is get a sense of like, 
we have um, these four sites, what are the lateral migration rates and bank erosion rates um, associated with these sites? And how different are those rates in comparison to the average over the 48 kilometer segment, okay? Now, sure, that 48 kilometer segment is gonna have a lot of other high density muscle sites as well as low density muscle sites, but just on average, how do they compare? And so we basically did sort of a change detection approach based on aerial photograph comparisons over a 53 year period. And so from those image analyses, we, we digitize the location of the banks and we use changes in the bank positions to quantify the lateral migration rate for uh, 200 meter sections of this 48 kilometer uh, overall larger segment. And then we also identified in each section, what was a potential migration uh, mechanism? And so if the river was already migrating in 1965, we said it was a, it was a meander bend. But if it had something um, that was different in 2018 that looked like that could have caused a migration to start, then we made note of that. And so the predominant cause of migration was that there was already a meandering bend there. The least common cause of triggering a, a meandering event uh, or uh, processes was actually um, the occurrence of a bar, okay? So it was one of like four or five different possibilities. About 20% of the locations we couldn't ascribe any sort of a cause for. So once we had information about the locations and the amount of lateral migration that was taken, we used that information with bank height data that we derived from a one meter DEM from the US Geological Survey to quantify erosion volumes for those different sections. And so once we did this for the overall average of the 48 kilometer section, we compared those measurements for the 200 meter sites one through four um, research segments. And so what you can see here in these little pie charts is that um, the average lateral migration rate in meters per year um, was 0.08. And in comparison, all of the other high density mussel sites um, essentially had up to three times that amount of lateral migration. Similar kind of results for the bank erosion volumes, um, except in an even more pronounced effect where the bank erosion volumes were up to five times larger in the higher density sites. And it seemed to intensify with muscle density increases. So it seems that um, these muscle sites were basically uh, kind of facilitating bank erosion and lateral migration. So just to kind of conclude with this, uh, we think we have some pretty good evidence that supports the idea that these muscles are changing the bed stability. That is having an overall armoring and coarsening of the channel bed, which is causing sediment to uh, basically be preserved in the locations where they are. During high flow events, sediment get, gets bypassed and deposited downstream of them because velocity is decreasing as it goes through these um, high density reaches. And then over time, that establishes bars um, that causes uh, bank erosion to basically occur from flow deflection around these bars. I think I forgot to mention that the high density muscle sites all had bars as their a suspected mode of initiating lateral migration. So this is the connection there. Now, obviously this is a strong case for the Sipsi River because we have this really immense population that's been long lived in the, in the river. Um, but it may be true for other North American rivers. And so we have acknowledged through time as geomorphologists that people play a role in changing how the river adjusts over time through its sediment load, through its bed slope to inputs from external controls like climate and geology. But we maybe need to broaden that scope and think a little bit more about organisms and certain organisms. And I put this guy kind of in the middle here because I feel like he could move around the balance and, and play roles in obviously impacting the sediment load, but also potentially over time, changing the slope of the channel through its alteration of the sediment bed characteristics. So with that, I'll give my thanks to uh, the different entities that have supported this research over the years. And I will say there was a tremendous amount of help from students over time, and I really appreciate all of their efforts. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you to uh, Tim and Susan for inviting me over and uh, giving me this great opportunity to share some thoughts with you on um, self-protecting landscapes in hatherolithic lithologies. Um, and um, that uh, that's a topic that has 
kept me awake for a while now, and I'll, sh I'll show you why. Um, so first, if I can move, yeah, here we go. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about what those landscapes, what that actually means, heterolithic uh, lithologies, heterolithic landscapes. Um, here we have one example of uh, a heterolithic landscape uh, right here from the United States. It's in Utah in Canyonlands National Park. Uh, you can see why the river is called the Green River, right? We see that little tendril of green in a desert environment. But what I'm interested in here is um, showing you how this landscape is composed of at least two different rock types, um, hard sandstones and soft mudstones. And the sandstones are hard. It's clearly hard to break off pieces of that sandstone. And it is holding up the erosion, excavation, or denudation of this landscape um, uh, much more than the mudstone does. Um, and in fact, if you keep looking at this for a long time, as I have, then uh, you'll see many more combinations of hard and soft layers. Or you see, if we look at it differently, we see differences in erodibility and differences in, in um, uh, probably also weathering conditions uh, between uh, layers in this landscape. I focus now on the most clear pair of sandstone and mudstone rocks, but if you go higher in this landscape, uh, you see the same thing repeat. Um, if we zoom in <clears throat> to the center of the image, as I've done here, then we see another feature of such landscapes, and that is that once there is a collapse of uh, the harder overlying rock type, the sandstone in this case, then uh, we find that, that the blocks of that sandstone are actually protecting the underlying slopes uh, in, in the softer uh, mudstone rock type. Uh, if you see this once, you'll start seeing it everywhere in the image that the places where there are sandstone blocks overlying the mudstone slopes, that's where the mudstone slopes are more protected and they, they are less deeply eroded. Um, so there's an interesting interplay uh, at, at, at play uh, in these landscapes. There is, uh, on the one hand, sandstone, uh, the, the actual sedimentary rock, uh, holding up landscape erosion, uh, landscape denudation, um, uh, undermined by the easy excavation of the mudstone. But once the excavation has, has led to undermining and collapse of sandstone blocks, then we see that they also, in, in sort of secondary instance, uh, in second instance, they, they still protect slopes. Uh, and they need to weather in place or be themselves undermined and excavated and removed uh, in order to further uh, remove mudstone. Now, this is a beautiful example because there's hardly any vegetation and there's a lot of vertical uh, size in this landscape, but I am going to bring you to my real study site now. So this is actually Kansas, Dr. Ramos. I, uh, sorry, this is Kansas. I, I know you were talking about Dorothy earlier. Um, I, was, I was listening, of course. Um, so Dorothy did walk this landscape, um, and sometimes I think she still does. Um, this is my heterolithic landscape that I've studied, uh, and I'm continuing to study with several uh, PhD students um, because it's so amazingly interesting. Um, right now, uh, you see this landscape in its burnt state. So we are in the United States Great Plains in the state of Kansas. Uh, very continental climate, which is to say uh, very cold winters, very warm summers, dry winters as well, um, and uh, a, both a natural and by now a managed process in these landscapes is, is burning the grass, um, among others, to keep the uh, forest encroachment at bay. Uh, and so the good thing about that is that if you go into these landscapes a week or two weeks after uh, the annual or semi-annual burn, uh, the landscape is beautifully visible, uh, and we see a lot of features that should hopefully now remind us of the previous slide. So let me annotate this a little bit for you, if I get this to respond. Here we go. Um, I drew in blue temporarily for you um, hard layers. Uh, they're not sandstone in this case, but here they are limestone hard layers. So I'm going to remove these slides again and uh, show you again that um, they really are quite visible in the landscape. The white, the top of the white bands, I would say, are where we have the hard layers peaking out of the hill slope. And in between, we have much softer hill slopes formed in, in shale bedrock. Um, so I'm currently standing on the shale bedrock, taking a picture of that landscape. You see very nicely on the horizon that this landscape uh, is uh, very stepped as a result of an alternation of uh, up to 10 pairs of hard limestone and soft shale. 
Um, I will be talking about cliffs too. Uh, these are the kind of cliffs that I'm thinking of. And uh, maybe you're laughing at me now because you saw the previous slide and you're thinking those are real cliffs. Uh, but yes, these, these we do also call cliffs in Kansas um, because they function the same way that uh, for, for, as the cliffs that we just saw, minus the uh uh the the very deep undermining and the collapse and breakup of the undermined parts of the cliff that fall down that doesn't happen here here it's more of a slow release of blocks from that cliff in this landscape most of the the part the, the blocks that get released from cliffs um uh, as long as you stick to one particular cliff one particular limestone layer those are roughly of the same size because the the limestone that that forms the cliff or that forms the hard layers has been uh, pre-fractured we're talking roughly one cubic meter blocks um, in most cases so now that i've introduced you a little bit to this landscape uh, the last thing i'll say about it is that it's it's um uh, it's a biological research station that allows geomorphologists in so it's a beautiful interdisciplinary uh, uh approach uh, we we really profit from um from the great work by, by our biology colleagues uh, in this landscape. Um, so I, this is the landscape that I, that I have a lot of questions about. I want to know uh, how much do those hard layers hold up landscape development? How much do they make it steeper by making the hill slopes harder to erode? How slowly does that landscape respond uh, to external inputs such as uplift signals through the main river channels? Um, uh, how uh, you know what's what's the the real role of the limestone blocks because once they are on those slopes as you've seen in the previous landscape as well they will armor that hill slope and prevent its erosion. So the key questions I'll focus on in this slide uh, in this slideshow as well are uh, relate to work that's being done by my my PhD students uh, mostly. Um, uh, one is what are the key processes that drive change in this landscape. How fast are these processes secondarily? And then finally, what does it mean for landscape evolution pathways? And we will use uh, fieldwork for the first question, um, uh, geochronology for the second, of course, and then uh, landscape evolution modeling for the third uh, question. As as, uh, as Lisa was just now, I, I'll try to be rather brief on the methods, um, but if you do have any questions about those, either email me or ask me right after uh, this talk. I'm eager to explain. Um, so um, the first question, which processes change block and cliff properties? Um, uh, we tackled, and, and my, my, my PhD student Nick McCarroll tackled um, in a recently published paper by um, painstakingly walking along cliffs and at regular intervals um, walk from a cliff down the slope and record several properties of all the blocks within a two meter wide swath for the next 30 meters down the slope. Uh, in this way, he visited 30 transects um, and he characterized the properties of 842 uh, blocks, limestone blocks. Uh, and he, he drew that in this, in this diagram as well. And so I'll talk mainly about the block properties, a little bit less about the cliff properties here. Um, uh, but properties that we are interested in uh, include shape. Uh, that is because literature has suggested, uh, before Nick's work, uh, literature suggested that um, cubes might roll and tumble, even if it's very slowly through undermining, um, whereas tiles might slide along with the creeping, diffusing hill slope. So we wanted to see if that uh, played out here as well. Block size, as well, uh, of course, because we're interested in how the blocks get smaller as they weather on their way down the hill slope. Uh, we're interested in orientation relative to the slope to capture some of what perhaps is rolling and tumbling. If you don't roll and tumble, your orientation relative to the slope should remain the same after all. If you do, then that orientation should change. And we're very interested in the weathering process itself of what makes the blocks smaller if they do become smaller. So flaking, spalling, and dissolution. And I'll show you a few of the key images there. I'll start in the center here, not on the left, but in the center, uh, image B, where um, if you add up the sum of the size of the area, sorry, of all the blocks um, uh, across all the transects, um, then we see a very clear 
the decrease in how many blocks are on the hill slope or how, how large the blocks on the hill slope are with increasing distance from the cliff face. I think that makes total sense. It should it should be so that as blocks weather, as they get smaller, um, as they uh, perhaps fragment into what we would call soil, uh, the fine earth fraction, then yes, of course, at that point, uh, we should see less coverage of the hill slope with blocks, less armoring as well. Uh, so that's that's probably the clearest signal we got uh, and fits with our expectations. If I move to the right from there, uh, we can look not only at the total block area, but also at the area uh, uh, taken up by different individual blocks. So these are the 842 dots that you're looking at, the, the, all the blocks that Nick visited. Uh, and we highlighted the, the largest and the fifth and 15th largest blocks here to show you that with increasing distance from the cliff face, not only the total amount and the total area covered by blocks, but also their individual size uh, clearly decreases. Um, then back to the left, what is perhaps a little harder to get at is um, this image where uh, the x-axis is block size, so not distance from cliff phase, and the y-axis is how weathered those blocks are. And what we see is, is a weak indication, I would say, of a parabolic relation, but the parabolic relation itself makes intuitive sense, so I will, I will accept it for the moment, um, where the largest blocks um are probably are relatively little weathered uh, and so are many of the smallest blocks and we're talking very small blocks at that point on the left of that x-axis but the intermediate uh blocks are actually the most weathered and when i say weathered in this case it means showing signs of pitting and uh, and other forms of dissolution so on the y-axis you're reading dissolution uh, percentage of surface uh, uh, that clearly uh, expresses dissolution. This is this was uh, interesting to us, uh, and, and we we attempted to explain that um, we believe that what we're seeing is that is the impact of dissolution on the larger blocks that takes a little time to to uh, to get going. It takes a lot, lot time to develop. So as the blocks get smaller, you would see more signs of that dissolution. That would be the right half of that image. But at the same time. Clearly, there is a physical weathering process going on in the area um, that produces uh, fresh, smaller blocks off of the bigger blocks. So uh, a spalling process is what we're imagining there. Um, and that's very strongly linked probably to the fire regime in this uh, in this natural grassland. Um, so uh, we do not we did not find evidence of rotating or tumbling of either cubical blocks or very, very flat, tiley blocks. Uh, so even for the cubes, apparently sliding is the main transport process that brings the blocks downhill slopes over time. Uh, and uh, that was very, you know, statistically very convincing. Uh, find behind that that I'm, I'm not showing, but that you could find in the paper. Um, and in fact, if you look at it, there's surprisingly little difference between cubes and tiles in all the properties that uh, we've looked at. Um, their their size, their distance from the uh, from the cliff, and so on. Those those are not very different between cubes and tiles. Whereas we expected that cubes would would behave fundamentally differently, uh, that they would move faster, for instance, so that they would be bigger at at a larger distance from the cliff than tiles are. Well, none of that was true. Um, and, and relating to that weathering story, again, we, we find that newly released large blocks uh, exhibit only a few signs of dissolution, uh, uh, whereas the intermediate sized blocks do, um, and the smallest blocks, again, do not. And so that means that we're looking at a mixture of physical and chemical uh, weathering processes here. So that's that that helped us understand a little bit more about what's going on in this landscape. Um, and uh, the next thing that that Nick is is doing, or I would say has done by now, is um, is looking at uh, process rates, and uh, in his case, looking at rates uh, with which those blocks move down a hill slope after they've been released from their cliff. This will tell us something not only about the primary rate of movement of the blocks, but also about the time scale of hill slope armoring over which timescales the armor is refreshed. And for that method, or for that purpose, we use exposure dating of limestone blocks. Um, I, I put an image up here, a famous image actually, uh, of, of um, 
of the production process of cosmogenic nuclides, in this case for beryllium on the image, but we used uh, chlorine 36. Chlorine 36 is suitable to uh, exposure date limestone blocks and beryllium is, is not. So that's why uh, we focus on chlorine. Um, we took uh, and uh, yeah, we took 20 samples uh, from two transects that Nick liked best, where we had clear um, clear progression of blocks uh, away from the cliffside, and uh, we are interested, of course, in relating the age of the block to the distance from the cliff. Uh, you'll see that in the next slide. Uh, our sort of constituent um, equation there, if you want, is that the observed rate of block movement between uh, brackets there. Um, equals the cliff retreat rate plus the real block movement rate. So what do I mean with that? I have this, this diagram over here in the right bottom of the image. Um, if we think of blocks for a second as these rather idealized, almost Lego pieces, then, um, uh, then I think that allows us to understand that finding a block at 10 meters from the current cliff for instance, that doesn't mean that it actually traveled 10 meters. It may have uh, been released from a cliff, from the cliff, when that cliff was much closer uh, to the block than it is right now. So we're aware that we're measuring something, the observed rate of block movement in between brackets, um, that actually is composed of two components that we're both very interested in. We do want to know the cliff retreat rate because it's a key landscape denudation metric. Um, it, it, it tells us how quickly these landscapes are denuding in a horizontal sense, at least. But we're also really interested in how quickly the blocks move. Um, and and yeah, unfortunately, we're, we're not disentangling both of them uh, uh, very well with this method uh, so far. But we do get that overall number. Um, the sampling, of course, is always beautiful for these purposes um, uh, with a lot of dust. Um, and um, Here's the result. These are uh, numbers like literally that came to my desk yesterday. So I hope you share my excitement here. Um, so we have the distance from the cliff edge again on the x-axis, the block age on the y-axis. And um, we see no blocks that are younger than 20,000 years. That is a first sort of, it was a little bit surprising to us. Um, it does make sense that no blocks are actually zero years old because by the time the cliff is visible, those the rocks from the cliff have already accumulated the cosmogenic exposure signal, but that they are this old was surprising, strongly suggests that for perhaps the cliffs only break off and, and, and function in the in this way during glacial times, very glacial conditions. Um, we also see a, a faster rate of block movement for the orange blocks, that, which were on a steeper uh, segment of a hill slope. Um, and uh, we get roughly cliff retreat rates, at least we get roughly block movement rates uh, in the order of a meter per thousand years. Uh, so that's a key uh, metric for our landscape that we've, or we, we now have a feeling for. I say less than one meter per kilo year because that, that number that we're getting includes also that actual block movement rate. Now, finally, uh, in the few remaining minutes, I hope, um, uh, Briefly, I'll show you something about landscape evolution model simulations that we're doing for landscapes like these. We use a one-dimensional one hill slope that you see six times here on the right. And uh, we use multiple hard and soft layers uh, in that uh, horizontally layer, uh, horizontally uh, laid down uh, hard and soft layers in this landscape. Uh, and the model simulates how soft weather, bedrock weathers into regolith, how regolith diffuses, and how hard, hard layers are undermined and release blocks and how the blocks then subsequently move. And we use an existing model by Glade et al. that we adapted for, for the use of multiple layers. What you see on the right is that uh, in, in panel A, for instance, there are four blocks on their way down the hill slope, moving, moving very slowly over time. The red hard layer on the left of that panel A is, is holding up clearly um, uh, landscape uh, denudation and landscape erosion there. And over time, we see the 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 sort of uh, the presence of a of a new hard layer coming into that landscape, and it then subsequently holds back the uh, the activity in that landscape. So, if we look at those base simulations uh, a bit more in detail, um, we have the lateral retreat very clearly visible of of those two hard layers that kind of uh, make up these six panels. We see clearly that blocks move down slope. I hope you can see that they get smaller. 
over time as well. Tim, that hand means, does that mean three minutes? Okay, thank you. And um, uh, yeah, we see the basic functioning of a model. This is a, a reality test for us. Like, does this model do what we wanted to do? And it does seem to do that. Um, of course, we're then interested in what, in the actual more complex dynamics that play out at the larger scale. And here, what I, what I show is the time series of denudation of the landscape at four different aggregation levels. At the bottom, you're almost looking at individual years. And we see that spikes of activity happen when blocks get moving around in this landscape, whereas much less spiky behavior happens when blocks are not moving and the landscape is merely diffusing. That's the bottom panel. If you go to the middle and the top panels, you see how um, specific uh, sort of uh, high points of activity happen when a block is completely exported from the entire catchment because that's a lot of mass loss in one timestamp. Um, and in the top panel, especially, you see the impact of new layers being exposed at the bottom of the landscape and old layers being completely removed at the top of the landscape. The end result is a very complex uh, time series of, of denudation, all of that from a stable uplift rate. And so these landscapes not only protect themselves relatively well through the armoring and, and make themselves steeper, as I shall so show you soon, they also um, make for a very complicated um, uh, response to a very simple external signal in, of uplift. Now, of course, we're interested in figuring out how the sedimentary layout, so how, how the proportion of hard and soft layers and their distance um, uh, changes uh, these, these metrics. And, and what this image shows, I'll try to be briefer than I intended, is that how far the layers are apart, that's the layer separation, how thick the hard layers are, and how quickly the blocks that are produced weather, all of those have an impact on the denudation signal, the time series uh, that are uh, in the top four and the, I guess the third four panels. And it also impacts uh, the eventual shape of the landscape. Landscapes are overall steeper when blocks stay around for a long time, when the hard layers are thicker and closer together. Relatively intuitive, I would say. That makes me happy that my model does something intuitive on occasion. Um, finally, um, this is this is where most of our excitement right now sits, and, and Nick is actively working on this image. So uh, he did allow me to show this to you, but it's definitely preliminary. He plotted here on the x-axis only how much hard rock there is. So uh, it could be very thin hard layers that are hardly separated from each other, or thick hard layers that are still quite separated. Um, but we we capture all of that in the fraction of resistant rock. So 0 0.8 means the landscape is almost completely hard rock. Zero means it is completely soft rock. There is no hard layer. That's the, the blue arrow case. In that case, uh, the steepness of the landscape is about 0 0.1. As you can see here on the, on the y-axis, that's the steepness of the landscape. Our landscape gets steeper if we look at the squares, if we increase more and more the fraction of hard rock, and we don't quickly weather the blocks that that produces. So that makes sense. More hard rock, more cliffs, steeper landscapes. Uh, and we see a few real landscapes in the world actually plot really nicely on that line. Slightly harder to get uh, is how the landscape where we weather those blocks quite quickly once they get undermined, how that landscape stays almost as flat as the case without any hard layers until about uh, you know half of that landscape is composed of the hard rocks. Um, uh, this has to do with, with the very, very quick weathering that we're currently imposing on that scenario um, before ultimately that landscape becomes uh, basically only composed of blocks that immediately tumble down and therefore uh, the landscape becomes really steep again. I saw the new hand, Tim, so I'm going to stop here. I'm basically repeating my key points and um, give over to you. Thank you. I'm in the field right now. <laughs> I'm actually in Nain, Nenitsdiavit, which is um, Inuit territory in northern Labrador. And uh, I'm over at a friend's house borrowing their internet because uh, up here we don't have very good internet connection um, or, or cell service or anything like that. So I'll just uh, say in advance that there are fewer pictures in this talk than I would have liked because I've been here for um, almost four weeks already. and. Uh, 
I have not been able to download many pictures and put them into my presentation. So I hope that you can follow along with my voice, um, which I know is a little hard to do on Zoom. But thank you so much to the conveners for organizing. And thank you um, to everybody who's part of the call now. Um, I'm, I'm Emma. I'm from Dalhousie University, which is a university in Nova Scotia. And um, I also want to say thank you to the many people who have been involved in the creation of this research. So I'm going to talk about co-producing research with Indigenous communities, specifically the Inuit community in Minnetsdiavit, uh, the different ways that I'm involved in that, and um, also sort of some of the principles around research co-production as well, which is kind of a new topic, I think, for the geomorphic community. The reason that it's of interest to me personally um, so I'm a, I'm a geologist, a geomorphologist. Prior to this, I was um, working mostly in critical zone science, where I would use cosmogenic radionuclide dating, thanks Arnaud for explaining how to do that, um, to track different types of earth surface processes. And um, a lot of my research was very, you know, um, fundamental, kind of basic principles kind of work. Um, and then on the side, outside of my job, uh, I was working as an environmental justice activist. Um, I formed an organization along with some friends of mine called the Center for Interdisciplinary Environmental Justice that started doing scientific work um, to support communities, indigenous communities, um, in their sort of struggles to protect their lands, their ancestral homelands, um, primarily from lithium mining for um, green energy technologies. So in order to do that work with it, indigenous communities, we had to define a praxis for ourselves of how we would be in relationship to those communities, um, which we call a decolonial feminist science praxis. Um, and, you know, there's a, I'll throw in the chat a link to our website and some of the publications that we have on this. But that was sort of my, my previous life. And then um, when I entered this new postdoctoral position, um, my real motivation was to try and find a way to meld these two pathways so that I could start to value align my research. <clears throat> so I'm working in the north now. Um, this is, you know, one of the sort of this is an image of um, Inuit Nenengat. These are the five different regions, um, Inuit regions of, of the Arctic, northern Canada. And um, Inuit Nenengat has a organization called Inuit Tapirit Kanatami, which I'm, I am pronouncing incorrectly, um, or ITK for short. And ITK is a coalition of representatives from all of these different areas that work to um, represent and position Inuit interests nationally in Canada and internationally as well. And um, they have a document that I really encourage everyone to look at and read, which is called the National Inuit Strategy on Research. And it lays out basically the historic role that research and researchers have played um, in Inuit lands in Canada. Uh, and I've highlighted a really significant paragraph here where we talk about how research has often been exploitative, how it's advanced uh, racism and how it has basically benefited the researchers instead of the communities. And this document, which is really powerful and, and very well articulated, um, includes, you know, very specific demands or, or um, things that, that Inuit communities want researchers to do differently. And so, you know, it's not just a, this is what's been wrong, but it's also a, this is how you do it right. And this is the kind of um, like sort of fundamental like principles and documents that make it so exciting and wonderful to work in this context. So I'm working in Nenetsdiavet. Nenetsdiavet is an Inuit for our beautiful land. Um, it's located in Northern Labrador. So you can see a little stars just off the coast of Greenland. It's actually south of the technical Arctic Circle, but it's absolutely an Arctic territory. It's a sea ice dominated environment. The Labrador current is bringing cold Arctic waters along the coast all the time. Um, and it's composed of these five Inuit communities, um, Nain, Hopedale, Makovic, Postville, and Rigolet. And uh, Nain is the largest of these communities. It has about a thousand people living there. Um, the other communities are smaller, uh, around 200 people each. And 
they're very remote, they're disconnected from any kind of road access. So in the winter time, these communities are connected by the sea ice highway. Uh, people travel on snowmobile between communities. Um, and it's a much more efficient and like better way to get around than the other ways of travel, which would be, you know, the small airplanes, the twin otter airplanes that come in and service the communities. Or in the summertime, open water season, there's a ferry that runs once a week. But just for your perspective, it can take only a couple hours to drive from snowmobile from one community to the other, and it will take like five to eight on the ferry. Um, there's a lot of interruptions from weather and all of these kinds of things. So it's a it's a place that has like very specific challenges, like both for field work and also just for access um, working here. And it's part of the reason that research success depends so much on incorporating local community members. And um, the Inuit way of life is is has really deep relationality to the land. Um, you know, people rely a lot on subsistence harvesting. Um, they have, you know, really incredible knowledge of their land and they spend an incredible amount of time, even from like a very young age, being out and teaching each other and sharing information and things like that. So it's a it's a it's a place where, you know, um it, you really like have the capacity to work with people who are like you know deeply intimate and familiar with the the types of processes that are that are working in this landscape. So it's it's amazing. And um Nanit Stiavit has a land claim agreement with Canada. They have you know territorial sovereignty. Um, that land claim agreement was established in 2005 and so it's pretty recent, right? And along with the creation of their constitution, their government, um, their, their treaties with Canada, they also created a bunch of different departments for managing and conserving their resources, um, a national park, a secretariat, wildlife division, all of these types of things, a, a commercial fishery. Um, it's really incredible, actually. And uh, as well, they created a entire environmental research division which is to promote and encourage research in Nenetsdiavet. So far from the move to sovereignty being something that shuts research out, actually what they did is create a bunch of infrastructure for bringing researchers in, for connecting researchers to community and things like that. So part of the process for working here is submitting an application to the Nenetsdiavet Government Research Advisory Board. And what they're looking for in these applications are, you know, do you have community contacts? Have you done any consultation? Like, how are you planning to share your results and things like that with the communities? And, you know, do you have any awareness of the ongoing issues that are important to people here? And, you know, they have done so much, like the NG has done so much for, you know, my work personally, um, I started this job a year and a half ago and I've spent more than five months living up here and I stay in this like research center um, where like it's easy for me to, you know, I don't have to pay rent, like I can use their skidoos, like, you know, they connect me to all these other researchers who are doing similar work on either sea ice or erosion or the types of things that I'm involved with here. Um, and, you know, they also help me make local community contacts. Um, people who can either help take me off or, you know, tell me where the important habitats are or those kinds of things. And so um, there's really just a lot of structure in place that that helps uh, helps researchers, um, you know, do their work. So the um, project that I'm part of is called the Sustainable Nanette Stiavit Futures Project. It's a collaboration between the Nanette Stiavit government and uh, two Southern universities, Memorial University in St. John's and Dalhousie, where I'm from. Um, and it's it's funded by the Ocean Frontiers Institute. And it's kind of like a it's a it's a really large project with many different components, research components that are all focused on working together to understand the ways in which climate change is impacting the Nenetsdiavet coastline. And this is really a front lines of climate change kind of situation. So um, a big focus of the project is also knowledge co-production, right? It's this idea of 
you know, Inuit knowledge and scientific knowledge, how do they work together? How do they build new things together? Um, and so, you know, my, my role within the project um, as a postdoctoral researcher is to support two different community-based coastal monitoring projects. So if my next slide will show up. Um, one of them is that I get to work with Inuit youth research coordinators from uh, four of the five communities in Inuit Stiavit to monitor changes in the physical oceanography. So we go off three times a year, every year, and we take CTD casts, which measure the salinity and temperature of the ocean water um, underneath the sea ice. And then in the summertime and boats, like along this you know, transect, for example, um, in the bottom corner, you can see it. So these are like the sites that we have along uh, Nain Bay, which is, which is nearby. And you know, we, we started off with consultation in each of the communities where they told us what were the significant places. And then we designed this transect to go from inputs of the freshwater, the rivers, all the way out to the edge of the, the ice, the Sina, the flow edge, the end of the, the land fast ice. So we do this project each year. This is one of the reasons that I'm up here now is doing this work. Um, and this is an example of like scientific data collected by Inuit to monitor coastal change. Um, I also run a like observer program. So this is a network um, that we're just starting to establish that goes in each of the coastal communities um, where elders who are, you know, really highly respected members of their community because of their experience on the land and their knowledge of the sea ice, um, they work with me to record narrative observations of the ice conditions. Um, and the ways in which those ice conditions have reverberating effects through the ecosystem and also to the people who depend on the sea ice. Um, and so this is a this is an example of Inuit knowledge being used to monitor coastal change. And I just want to say, like these projects, this one in particular, you know, what's going on here is we have we have one type of knowledge that's being you know recorded and transformed into like something like a scientific data set right so these narrative observations create a record of change that we then host in a database and that we can use for different types of data analysis in the future right that's the idea and i don't perceive this as a knowledge co-production myself personally because the new new information isn't necessarily being generated, right? Like we're not creating something new from Inuit knowledge. We're using Inuit knowledge to create a scientific product. And that is that is actually kind of a co-optation. I think it, it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with the project. It's actually a really cool project and it becomes very useful for people. But um, there's like a clarity with which we need to like call it what it is, right? Like like turning something into a scientific product is is not necessarily the best way to like respect and represent the knowledge itself, but it is something that has a lot of like utility for the community. And so these are kind of the delicate tensions that come out from doing this kind of work, even when you're really, you know, doing a good job of forming relationships and being embedded, you can still end up kind of calling something uh, like with a type of language that maybe sounds very good in an academic setting, but isn't necessarily like authentic to the purpose of the project. And so I just want to, you know, have some clarity around that, right, as I talk about it. Um, and people have looked a lot at co-producing research with communities, indigenous communities or other, other otherwise, and there's been an especially strong push for it as conversations around pilot or I'm sorry, what is it? Parachute science are, are coming out, right? Like we're like, oh, okay, we can't just be going places and extracting and not talking to local community members and things like that. And um, this is a this is a big conversation in the scientific community as a whole. And I think it's also becoming part of what we as geomorphologists talk about. Um, there's there's plenty of of new publications out there that synthesize 
co-production, you know, research. And there's some principles that have emerged from those kinds of things, like that you should spend time in community, that you should develop relationships with community, that you should, you know, respond to local needs and interests in your work and all of those kinds of things. And I think those are good, strong core principles for how to conduct oneself. But I'm asking for a little more creativity in how we produce something, because we all know how to collaborate with each other. You know, we have collaborators that we work with and we don't need to validate or question their expertise when they contribute it to a project. And so um, in the next little section of the, the time I have with you, um, I'm gonna describe what I, what I feel is a real co-production kind of project, something that is built from both scientific methods and Inuit knowledge, and uh, has sort of a new, you know, um, a new outcome, right, that we're, that we're working on. And there's a paper that you can check out with the QR code if you're, if you're interested in having more details about it. Um, so, you know, high latitude coastal erosion, it's a huge problem all over the Arctic. Um, we're documenting really fast increases in erosion rates. Um, they're driven by things that have to do specifically with high latitude environments. Uh, so I think my next slide has the example, so I'm just going to switch to it, sorry. <laughs> Which is, you know, as sea ice cover decreases, you have a longer fetch length, which is an open water length, drives up the waves. The waves become much bigger because the wind has a longer distance over which to blow over the water. Um, sea surface temperatures are thawing the permafrost in the, the cliffs. And then there's also a seasonality component to like when storms come. Is that a three minute war warning? Yes, great, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, the point is that a lot of work has been done on this. A lot of work is monitoring it, but it's working at really coarse spatial resolutions. They're working with satellite data sets for sea surface temperature and, and things like that, which are, you know, able to give these like general pictures of the link between climate change and, and coastal erosion, but they're not able to address the local concerns that are associated to it. So working with um, the web, basically in the NITSD of it, the hot spot for coastal erosion, the place that's eroding the fastest is Web Bay. It's just north of Nain. It's an ancestral home site. So I'm just gonna go kind of quickly since my time's running out. But this, this cabin was built over 250 years ago by the family. There's an example of the saw that they used to use, which is two stories tall, someone standing on scaffolding, someone's down below. And there, you know, five generations of family were, were born here um, before there was a, a relocation to the existing community um, related to the boarding schools. Uh, this place has started eroding like crazy gangbusters. In the last five years, they're losing meters and meters and meters of coastline every year. And they've got all of these different things that they're doing to try and intervene, but nothing's working, right? So there's a scientific research interest, which is what's causing the change and how is it linked to climate change and what do we do about it? And then there's a familial and a personal interest, which is related to connection to the land, access to ancestral sites, and you know how do we maintain our, our way of life, right? And so, these are the factors here on the screen that the family have told me is influencing the um, the changes, you know, that they that they're ex experiencing. <clears throat> and these are our research objectives, which is to understand those links and collect data that we're going to use for a pilot erosion prevention study um, that we're going to do together. So how have we established like historic baselines for those kinds of things? We're using logbooks that the family recorded, historic photos that they've dug out of their family, photo albums for us, things like that, um, as well as we've got sediment cores that we've taken um, offshore. And um, we're doing Cosmo on the, the bluff as well to get like really long-term geomorphic process pictures involved here. And we're also bringing the family member to the lab to show them how all of this stuff works besides doing all the field work with them. And it's been crazy important to do the field work with them. We put in um, wave height and sea level sensors last summer and started doing LIDAR surveys of the undercutting um, and the cliff there. 
And how did we pick where we put them? You know, these guys know where the currents are. They know where the longest, like the, the winds are coming in the strongest, all of these kinds of things. So when we set up our field work, we can actually target the processes that they already know are in place, right? And so this is kind of that example of the co-production I'm talking about, where it's like, you know, we use the wave sensors to estimate storm surges based off of climate change projections, climate model projections for wind and things like that. I see you, thank you. <laughs> and um, and like, and we are able to, you know, design the like design the whole study using the Inuit knowledge, which is like a multi generational observational knowledge of the landscape and these kinds of things. So um, I'm so sorry that I talked so long in my first section of this, but just to say, you know, last weekend we had a meeting. The entire family was there, um, and we came up with you know, a proposal for the next steps of the project, which is going to involve a baseline survey with drone photogrammetry this summer. And um, we're going to be teaching a bunch of other drone pilots from the coast how to do that same kind of survey. And then we're going to test this very cool type of um, erosion prevention that's never been used in the Arctic before and see how it works and see if it will work for us in other parts of Nenitsdiava as well. Um, a lot of different funding contributed to us being able to do this, uh, as well as, you know, just the support from the, the project that I mentioned earlier for just allowing me to spend a bunch of time up here. Um, we're on Facebook, I'm on Facebook, and uh, you, can, you can connect with me there because we post a lot of updates about the project as we go. So thank you so much for your time, uh, and sorry for talking so long. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for joining us today. This has been you know, some exciting talks already. And the work that I'm presenting today, um, I am a brand new assistant professor, but the work that I'm presenting today was part of my um, dissertation, which uh, my advisor you've already heard from today, Lisa Davis from the University of Alabama. So the work that I'm presenting today was really um, a collaboration between her and I over the last um, I don't know, five or six years. Uh, so I just wanted to briefly introduce myself and say, you know, here I am excited about produce or uh, sharing my paleo flood work. And generally what I'm interested in, the when, where, and why of extreme floods. And right now I'm particularly interested in extreme flood drivers, which can fall into three broad categories, meteorological drivers, um, watershed drivers and channel drivers. And it's really, and, and those drivers tend to interact simultaneously. So it can be very complicated to disentangle um, what is driving extreme floods. Part of the reason it's so complicated to do that is because we just don't have a lot of observations of extreme floods. Here's some uh, examples of where these uh, gauge records from stream flow measurements have maybe one or two floods and that's hardly a pad extreme floods and that's hardly a pattern um, and then beyond that it's very complicated to understand these the interactions of these drivers because once the meteorological driver in the form of precipitation hits the ground we as geomorphologists know that there is a complex threshold response throughout the system existing all the way from the poor scale to the regional scale. And so my goal today is to attempt to use paleo flood information, which is uh, related to natural sedimentary records of floods to derive some insights about uh, what drives those extreme floods. And so here's some figures of, of a fresh flood here, um, one month old in, uh, in Montana. And here are some soils forming in alluvial overbank deposits um, representing 2,000 years of flood information. And then here are some uh, kind of KV deposits <laughs> which have um, flood deposits you can see here periodically interrupted by cave deposition above it um, and in this particular site representing 6,000 years of information. So we can get Luckily for us, rivers are stream gauging, so we can get um, very specific information about how big these floods were 
and when did they occur so that we can get a longer term perspective on flood hazards and their drivers and how those change over time. So the study that I'll be talking to you guys about today um, is from a recent paper uh, that Lisa and I published in Quaternary Science Reviews, which includes a synthesis of paleo flood information in the lower Tennessee River Valley. Um, there's kind of a growing population of paleo flood data in the Tennessee River Valley. And in fact, uh, Lisa and I are currently working in some of the upper reaches um, to uh, expand this paleo flood information. So I'm sure there'll be more for you to look forward to in the next coming um, months. But teaming up here with the USGS, which created a what I would call a more traditional paleo flood record using um, stage as the indicator of magnitude, because in near Chattanooga, the river, the Tennessee River, is constrained by bedrock gorges. And so you're able to get um, up to these high elevation ledges where the minimum stage of that flood de deposit is providing critical information about the magnitude of that flood because it's censoring out all of the moderate and more frequent um, flood magnitudes. Only the most extreme floods are going to, by stage, reach this height. Um, and so we have all of our red triangles here represent locations where either the USGS group or myself and Lisa have reconstructed um, this kind of topographic stage reconstruction of paleo floods. Um, in our floodplain sites, we don't have the benefit of using paleo stage alone to um, provide insight of the magnitude of that information. So we have to use the grain sizes that that flood is transporting to give insight into how much energy that flood it has. So when you know grain sizes are left behind on the floodplain, we're able to kind of retrodict what the magnitude of that flood would look like. So um, in studies that you may have seen in recent years have used overlapping gauge records to develop like essentially a linear regression between particle size and directly to discharge. Um, but we had a unique situation on the lower Tennessee River Valley, which is we chose a relatively high floodplain. Um, and we've also had a regulation through a series of dams on this river um, since the 1936. And so we don't have overlap between our sedimentary record and our gauge record. So uh, Lisa and I developed kind of this new procedure, which utilizes shear stress equations, a reworked shear stress equation, to estimate paleo flood discharge, or at least the minimum paleo flood discharge to transport that particle. Um, so we do that first by actually identifying the paleo floods, which is in the floodplain environment a little bit more complicated than you might expect because of soil processes um, and excessive. Uh, sedimentation rates kind of disrupts, of, of course, sand in the natural levee environment, disrupts um, flood structures that we might otherwise use to identify individual floods. So what we can do and what we have done is measured grain size at one centimeter resolution. Um, and then we identified the grain size classes through end member modeling, uh, which are associated with floods and use kind of statistics to detrend other factors such as ch channel migration and changes in surface roughness over time um, to detrend uh, peaks in coarse sand material. Um, in our case, we're using medium sand or larger um, to identify significant flood peaks. And then once we have those flood peaks, we can extract the D90 of those peaks and plug it in here to our reworked shear stress equation. You can feel free to ask questions about that later. And then we get a minimum stage to initiate the velocity necessary to transport that particle. And so then we're kind of moving back into the more traditional paleo flood territory, which is to associate this stage with the discharge in our river reach. And so we do this through 1D hydraulic modeling, and because we have an actively aggrading floodplain, we have adjusted the floodplain to accommodate 
aggradation over time for these paleo floods, which someone like um, our USGS partners would not have to do in, to some extent, in the bedrock controlled gorges. Um, so that is a very fast overview of this paper that Lisa and I have in the Journal of Hydrology. Um, but now we're actually gonna get right into the results here. Um, so the synthesis of the USGS data in the gorge and um, other cave systems in the lower Tennessee River, as well as our floodplain, indicated that this mix of strategy for um, uh, magnitude estimation was actually highly uh, consistent in its discharge estimate, which we were pretty excited about because this is a brand new approach um, in the floodplain sites that are really great for systems that don't have great gauge overlap, which is honestly many regulated systems in North America. Uh, but once we put together all of these overlapping records, we get this synthesized uh, clustering of extreme floods over the last 10,000 years, and we see a pattern emerge of extreme floods occurring around these kind of very large uh, regional climatic events. Uh, right after the 8.2 uh, uh, thousand years before present event, um, the meltwater pulses, uh, we have a, an extreme flood cluster occurring 7,900 years before present. Um, we also have a series of floods happening between 6,000 and 4,900 years before present um, at the end of the Holocene climactic optimum. And then we also have uh, a kind of a quieter flood period, which is uh, pretty well seen throughout the um, the region between that 4,000 to 2,000 year period where we see an increase in flood magnitude, but we don't get back to our extreme flood clusters until about a thousand years ago until um, the ninth, until the 20th century um, where our flood record actually ends. So uh, we see these kind of three major flood clusters. Um, and what I'm going to be discussing for the rest of this talk is what are the potential hydrometeorological drivers that led to this kind of long-term persistent shifts in flood magnitude within the Tennessee River Basin. Um, and let me just say that these patterns actually are observed in other river systems, such as the upper uh, Mississippi and Missouri River systems. Um, we also see a similar pattern occurring in the Southwestern United States. And at least in the late Holocene, there's very similar trends in Europe as well. Um, so this is pretty exciting and pointing towards some more like large scale climatic controls of this kind of flood clustering. Um, so one thing that really sticks out is that even though each of them are happening during these big climate periods, there's not really a consistent, like it only happened in warm periods or only happened in cool periods. We have this kind of all of them are existing in really these transitions between the major periods. And so we think that there is something specific about these transitions um, that is leading to the flood clustering. So now we're going to use um, paleo flood proxies from other parts of, or other paleo flood proxies. So this is a speleothem record um, right near our site. Um, I believe this is War Eagle, cave that these speleothems came from. Um, and we have oxygen isotopes that are indicating uh, more negative values, indicating an increase in summer precipitation and more negative, I'm sorry, more positive oxygen isotope levels representing a decrease in total precipitation. Unfortunately, we are missing part of the record here in the uh, mid to late Holocene. Um, but one thing that really sticks out that we're seeing is that uh, extreme flood clusters are kind of consistently corresponding with increased summertime precipitation. Um, and this is actually not a very surprising result as recent, uh, other recent studies have found kind of this warm season, uh, the changing of flood seasonality is, is increasingly indicating that extreme floods are more likely in warm season precipitation than previously thought in the kind of very wet, cool season precip precipitation which is you know, winter in the North, North America. Um, and we also have a carbon isotope record from 
Raccoon Mountain, again, very close to our site from a speleothem record uh, from Dreezy and others in 2016. And we see kind of this emerging coupled pattern of drought or an extensive dry periods occurring prior to these increases in summertime precipitation and corresponding um, with our extreme flood events. And in fact, there are some scenarios where, you know, we see a lack of, we, we might see an increase of one and not the other, but we don't see, as we wouldn't expect to see, a flood response during that time. Um, and while we have this kind of quieter flood period in the mid to late Holocene, we're seeing kind of a decrease in just total precipitation variability. Um, although kind of an inching increase towards cool wet, which is consistent with what we would expect with the neoglacial period following the Holocene climactic optimum. Um, but there is one scenario here where we do see kind of our expected, uh, our expected configuration of drought to um, increased summer precipitation, but no flood response. And so this was actually kind of curious. I always get very interested in the outliers of our results. And so I then looked at the rate of change, of climate change um, during this period. So this is abrupt climate change events described by a, a, one, a greater than one standard deviation of uh, change rate or stepwise change rate in moisture and temperature per 200 years. So very fast um, climate uh, shifts in the mid-latitude North America. And we can kind of see they're really lining up here with our extreme flood clusters. And from a geomorphic perspective, this makes a lot of sense because our rivers are moving from one hydroclimate regime to another and not having enough time to uh, adjust to this new regime, and as a result, um, flood clustering occurs. And so this is kind of what conceptually I think that looks like, is we have this preconditioning event of drought altering the watershed, either through plant die-off or um, channel constriction or um, other factors that may lead to um, a kind of limited or changing the thresholds within the geomorphic system. And when we have our rough shifts to warm season precipitation, those geomorphic thresholds are exceeded. And then floods, extreme floods clustered in, in response and we get a readjustment period within the watershed, at which point we see a diminishing flood hazard for a period, um, particularly in the early to late Holocene period. Um, and we've seen kind of anecdotal examples of this in the modern analog, but of course we just don't have enough gauge record. These are very, these are considered outlier events. Like in British Columbia, we have extreme drought and wildfires followed by uh, deadly floods that occurred. And also in California, the drought flood configuration that led to the failure of the um, spillway. And um, so we wanted to, I, I wanted to test, is this really um, a coincidence or are we seeing a real interaction between drought hazards and flood hazards? And so what I set out to do was an event coincidence analysis with tree ring data of our late Holocene paleo floods. And I was using um, event coincidence analysis uses Poisson statistics to evaluate whether there is a not a a random distribution between two time series. And so we were able to find very significant results. The drought is a significant precursor event to extreme floods in the late Holocene in the Tennessee River Valley. And in particular, um, we see this drought becoming a significant precursor event when there is moderate or worse drought severity or a drought lasting longer than 10 consecutive years. Now this doesn't exactly tell us what processes related to drought are driving this relationship between drought and floods, but we do see that there is this emerging relationship between drought and floods that warrants um, further exploring. And the reason for that is because in the future, 
we see up to three fifths of the world is projected to experience accelerated dry to wet conditions during the next century in response to modern warming. Um, and so in particular in North America, we're seeing an increase in intensity of swings. And we're also seeing an, a decrease of in transition times. And so there's an urgent need to evaluate the risk of compound drought floods and hazards, which we manage quite differently, at least in the US, and to incorporate concepts of geomorphic thresholds into flood risk assessments. And then finally, to identify ways to manage rivers that allow these systems to readjust to increase precipitation variability. So thank you all very much. Um, I, I look forward to your questions. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Tim and Susan, for coordinating this IAJ webinar and for the invitation. Um, I will present uh, our work on geomorphological and hydrological responses to anthropogenic and the climate drivers during the Maya early Anthropocene uh, in Nashtun, in Peten, Guatemala. Um, <clears throat> researches on the rise and decline of the Maya civilization questions the importance of social environmental interactions. And recently, large scale work in the southern Maya lowlands has shown that it was one of the most densely populated regions in the world, and that the Maya territory of Nashtun had the highest density of archaeological structures and agrarian structures in the seasonal swamps. The karst depressions uh, represent up to half of the ancient territories, so the knowledge of the hydrosedimentary dynamics are crucial for understanding the interactions between the ancient Maya environment and climate. I present our work on the following two questions. What were the hydrological and sedimentological responses to anthropogenic and climate changes? And how do past hydrosedimentary dynamics shed light on the history of anthropization and the availability resources? About uh, regional settings, uh, the study area is located in the southern part of the Yucatan Peninsula. In this karst landscape, hilly areas alternate with polies called bajos, bullies, and sinkholes. The limnicity is very low. And the main bajo, called El Infierno, includes the lake depression with a wetland. Its watershed is covered by a semi-evergreen tropical forest, and the climate is warm, subhumid. During the late Holocene, the climate has experienced several dry periods. Nashtun, the city of Nashtun, was a major regional capital of the classic period. The oldest archaeological evidences of its hinterlands, the exploitation territory, date back 600 BCE. Nashtun was abandoned around 1000 uh, 1, CE, as many cities of the southern Maya lowlands during the late and terminal classic. About material and methods. This study implements a multi-scale and integrated paleolimnological, geoarchaeological, and hydrological approach. We created a baseline of current hydrological dynamics. The catchment area, the potential intermittent drainage system, and the Bajo Lake depression were modeled using a LIDAR dam. We characterized the current lake fluctuations using Biosometric probes, high water marks, and lichen streamline of bajo trees. The stratigraphy of the sedimentary field of the lake depression was established through 50 boreholes distributed along two transects. And three sediment series were analyzed using several indicators of environmental change using rain size of deposits, organic carbon calcium carbonate, aluminosilicates and oxidoxids contents, the relative contents of elements, the ratio of calcium to the sum of silicon, aluminum, and iron, and the rubidium strontium ratio, which are proxies for the intensity of carbonate autogenic productions. 
and uh, the relative sulfur content as a proxy for anoxic clay conditions. The carbon nitrogen ratio and the 13 carbon isotopic ratio of organic matter were used to characterize the lacustrine, palustrine, or drained environment and to detect the organic matter of plants with a C4 metabolism such as maize. We use magnetic susceptibility and syn section for petrography and soil micromorphology. We developed a chronological framework based on morphostratigraphy, ceramic chronology, 19 radiocarbon dates, and HDEPS models calculated using Bayesian chronological modeling. We estimated the accumulation rates of calcium carbonate and aluminosilicates and oxides to study the storage of carbonates and of silicate fractions. And the surfaces and volumes of the lake water bodies were modeled from interpretation of stratigraphic, sedimentary, ecological, and altimetric LIDAR data. About results and discussion. First, about the current baseline of seasonal and interannual hydrological variability, its nature and forcing. Currently, this lake is intermittent. The lake regime is karstic and evaporative. The interannual variability is characterized by the alternation of the regime of seasonal high water, characterized by a flood duration of less than three months, maximum depths of less than 0.5 meter, and a regime of very high seasonal waters, characterized by a duration of flooding of more than three months, maximum depths up to 2.5 meters, as indicated by high water marks and the lichen trim lines. This hydro system is particularly sensitive to biophysical and climatic parameters. About stratigraphy, sedimentology, chronology and accumulation rates of the sedimentary filling of the lake basin. The filling of the lake basin consists of four main sedimentary bodies, E1 to E4. E3 is nested within E4. E2 and E1 are superimposed on E4 and E3. E1 and E3 are wetly carbonated alluvial and colluvial silty clays whereas E2 and E4 are alluvial and colluvial carbonated clay seals. About the age and chronostratigraphic interpretations, E4, E3 transition is around 3.5 thousand BCE. E3, E2 transition is around 1.5 thousand BCE. And the transition E2, E1 is around significantly earlier at the ages of the lake depression than in the center, around 1,000 CE. About sedimentology, pedology, and geochemistry, we identified sorry, five to 10 sediment zones per series. For example, in this series CS2-S1, the markers of the sediment zone of E4 and E2 indicate more aquatic conditions than those of E3 and E1. About the CS2 S10, the same is true for markers in the sediment zone E2 compared to the zone E3 and E1. About accumulation rates of mineral fraction, the accumulation rates of mineral matter evolved in six periods. Three periods of higher accumulation rates are uh, period one, three, and five. Between 1.5 thousand BCE and 1.2 thousand CE, the ratio of accumulation rates of carbonates to that of aluminosilicates were two to three times higher. Now results about multi-centennial and multi-millennial variability of Holocene hydrosedimentary dynamics, nature and forcing. We identified Several seven major hydrological periods, HP1 to HP7, and six major periods of erosion and sediment transfer, ESTP1 to ESTP6, 
over the last six millennia. First, three anthropogenic baseline. The hydrological period one before 3.5 thousand BCE at the highest lake levels during the Holocene thermal maximum. The hydrological period two from 3.5 to 1.5 thousand BCE at low lake levels offset by a drier climate. During ESTP2, the erosion and sediment transfer period, uh, the very low accumulation rates in the Alberta value and the absence of coarse colluvium suggest biostatic conditions and a low or no anthropogenic impacts. Secondly, hydrosedimentary dynamics and their climatic and Maya anthropogenic control from 1.5,000 BCE to 1,000 CE. First, hydrological period three, between 1.5,000 BCE to 300 BCE. HP3 is marked by high lake level, while the climate is drier. But evidence of settlements and agricultural facilities are observed at this moment. So the lake transgression seems to have resulted from an anthropogenic modification of the hydrological budget. About the erosion and sediment transfer period three, between 1.5 thousand to 100 BCE, ESTP3 corresponds to the first main episode of Maya clays deposition with alluvial deposits in the wall lake depression and coarse colluvium at the foot slopes. Secondly, during hydrological period four, HP4 is characterized by low lake levels occurred during a wetter climate period. Its forcing appears to be mainly anthropogenic. The Maya clays probably formed an aquiclude or an aquitard. Another hypothesis, but not supported by archaeological and biological data, is a decrease in anthropogenic impacts. The erosion and sediment transfer period 4, 100 BCE to 200 CE, uh, show the absence of coarse colluvium and low alluviation, and it could indicate land abandonment, but not demonstrated by archaeological data, or more likely an anthropogenic reduction in sediment conductivity and or reduced sediment stocks. During the hydrological period 5, between 2 100 CE to 1000 CE, HP5 was characterized by high lake levels. And the erosion and sediment transfer period 5 at this moment correspond to the second main episode of Maya clays deposition with an increased alluviation and coarse colluvation during the peak of the monumental construction of the city and with a maximum alluviation during the demographic peak. Finally, hydrological period six from 1000 CE to 1.3 thousand CE. We are during a final and post anthropogenic baseline. We have a short episode of low lake level in response to grid growth phase during the 11th century CE. And after HP7, we have a decrease in the level of the lake due to the abandonment of the land and the drier climatic conditions. And the lack of colluvium and low alluviation uh, during ESTP6 result of the abandonment of Nashtun and the forest closure. So second part of results about implication of past hydro sedimentary dynamics for the history of anthropization and variation in water and soil resources. Documenting the first major anthropogenic impact as early as 1.5 thousand BCE, our study demonstrates early human settlements. Later, the first main episode of Maya clay deposition may reflect a relative influence of urban development initiated regionally and shows uh, its major and irreversible environmental consequences. Secondly, the major episode of Maya clay deposition occurred in response 
to the rise of monumental epicenter of national at this moment. Secondly, variation in water and soil resources and the resulting risks of ancient Maya. During ESTP 3B, the soil erosion management probably increased the agricultural traces construction observed in the hilly areas. In the former perennial wetlands, the aggradation of material resulting from erosion has allowed the formation of soil and the exploitation for maize cultivation. So hydraulic and agrarian facilities could contribute to a multimillennial palimpsest agrarian landscape. And the exploitation of resources during more than 1.5 thousand years during the pre-classic did not prevent the development of a regional capital in the same geographical space for another thousand years. Subsequently, episode of low lake levels HP6A could only reduce agricultural yields during the demographic peak and increase social and environmental, economic, and political tensions in the socio ecosystem shortly before or during the abandonment of the city. So, for conclusion, the study revealed, analyzed, and compared the response of this hydro system and morphosedimentary system. It provides information of the major golden space considered by Beach et al. 2015 for the Maya early Anthropocene. Details on the method, results, and discussion presented here were published in Quaternary Science Reviews last year and enforce the knowledge of past hydrosedimentary fluctuation will allow for the study of the agronomic and economic implications on the dynamics and sustainability of past social ecosystem and their current implications on the environmental dynamics of the Maya biosphere reserve. Okay, thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Thank you for inviting me and thank you for everyone who stuck around for this talk. Uh, as Tim said, I'm Will Odom. I'm a geologist at the US Geological Survey. Uh, I work in the Florence Bascom Geoscience Center, which is in Reston, Virginia, just outside DC. And uh, a big part of my job is mapping areas in the Appalachians and in the Catskills. So there's been a fair amount of boots on the ground mapping that we've been doing, but we've also been exploring a lot with deep learning mapping, uh, especially that which leverages high resolution LIDAR. And so today I'm going to give you sort of an overview of that work. Uh, before I get into it, I'd like to thank a couple of my collaborators, uh, particularly my supervisor, Dan Doctor, and our colleague, uh, Aaron Maxwell at West Virginia University, who's helped us a lot with this work. Uh, in the background, you can see a preview of some of this deep learning work that we've been doing. Uh, this is a map that one of our models generated of part of the Neversink River watershed, which I'll tell you all about in a few minutes. Um, in the background, you can see that we've got some areas mapped out in brown. Uh, those are where we've got some uh, shallow to exposed interbedded sandstones and shales. Uh, on our hill slopes in blue, you can see some undifferentiated colluvium and glacial materials. And then of course, down in the valleys, we've got our favorite, uh, the quaternary alluvium. Uh, so just a quick overview of what I'm going to tell you about. Um, I'll give you a quick little intro about the study area that I'll be uh, demonstrating these techniques on, the Delaware River Basin. Uh, I'm also going to give you a brief overview of the evolution of the digital mapping techniques that we've been using. And then uh, we'll get into the deep learning process a little bit. Now, like a couple of the preceding uh, speakers, my background is actually in cosmogenic nuclides. Uh, this is something that I've been getting into recently, so I'm not going to get uh, too into the weeds on the deep learning process, but if that's something you'd like to talk about with me later, I'd be happy to do so. Um, but overall, I'm going to show you our raster creation process, which is a critical part of how we uh, start training these models. I'll show you how the training process works a little bit, and then we'll get into exploring the results, uh, including the materials and landforms that we can map. And then I'll show you uh, some more recent work that we've been doing. So needless to say, uh, especially for this group, mapping landforms, surficial materials, and geomorphology has a lot of implications for uh, both the society, environment, and geoscience as a whole. Um, in particular, our work has been really influenced by uh, this 
understanding how reservoirs respond to uh, the landscapes upstream of them. And in particular, we're looking at uh, sediment storage and erosion. For example, here we've got a, a nice stream cut that during periods of heavy rain can contribute fine sediments to the river, which can go downstream to reservoirs and cause issues with water filtration. Um, we also are interested in quantifying groundwater storage and mapping out where we have emergences of groundwater. And then of course, we're also interested in climate, geochronology, and uh, overall science. So down in the bottom right, you can see me sampling a boulder for some exposure dating. The reason that we're interested in mapping out the Delaware River Basin is that it is a very important so source of water for a number of people. Uh, we've got a, over 17 million people who uh, depend on this watershed uh, for their drinking water. Uh, this includes the city of New York, as well as Philadelphia and lots of other uh, large cities in the area. In this map on the right, I've mapped out where we've got major reservoirs. Um, in particular, uh, I'd like to draw your attention to that reservoir that we see just northwest of New York City. That's the Never Sink River Wasp, Never Sink Reservoir. Uh, and that's the study area that we've been using as kind of a test bed to develop these mapping techniques and explore their efficacy. Uh, this is a very highly studied reservoir due to the fact that it supplies New York City with a lot of water. Um, and on the left, you can see some photos from there. So that top right image, uh, you have to kind of squint to see it, but there's a nice little spring emergence right there. Uh, in the middle top, uh, you can see that we've got a uh, hill slope of till that's been exposed by uh, stream erosion. And then of course, we've got the reservoir itself down there at the bottom. So within the Neversink and the Delaware River Basin as a whole, which I'll refer to as the DRB a few times, uh, we're interested in mapping out uh, basically all of the surficial geology and geomorphology. Um, a lot of what we see, especially in the northern part of the DRB, is this shallow or uh, exposed bedrock, which you can see with that bookish texture. Uh, we also see a, a great deal of till uh, in some areas when we're lucky. We see some moraines. And then we also see a, a good deal of uh, quaternary alluvium and other landscape features. Now, historically, mapping out these uh, materials, features, and deposits has required a great deal of field work. So uh, in these two images, you can see my colleague Dan Doctor out in the field. Um, we do a great deal of uh, boots on the ground mapping to both look at uh, unconsolidated materials like that till you can see on the left as well as these consolidated materials like this nicely bedded sandstone on the right. Now, obviously we can't do all of this work digitally. Uh, we still need to go and characterize their composition, uh, measure their bedding, things like that. But we have found that over the last few years, these advances that we've seen in the resolution of elevation models have greatly increased our efficiency and our ability to do uh, digital mapping. So. Just to kind of drive the point home, I've got a variety of uh, raster resolutions in this page. Uh, on the far left, you can see we've got our classic one arc second DEM hill shade. Um, you can see that we can pick out sort of broad features like hill slopes and valleys, but it's really only when you get into the 10 meter and especially the one meter resolution data that you can start to pick out things like individual braids of streams, individual beds of rocks, and you know these these streams that are cutting into till and all of those really fine scale textures. So that's really helped us map digitally and do work uh, both in the office and the field uh, and you know, digital reconnaissance as well. Now, when we combine that high resolution LIDAR with uh, new and recently developed deep learning technologies, we can even increase our efficiency and our precision more. Um, now, many of you are probably familiar with some form of uh, machine learning and deep learning. Uh, on the top, I've got probably one of the most popular ones. This is object ID. So this is one where uh, you, know, you can train a model to identify particular shapes and textures, for example, a cargo plane versus a puppy. Um, but this sort of work that we're interested in is more on the segmentation side. So on the bottom left, uh, this is an image I pulled from the Esri website you can see that they've got a model they've trained to identify uh, a, a road versus the surrounding environment. So a continuous, non-discrete feature. 
And what we're doing with mapping geology is basically the same thing. So we're interested in mapping out uh, these continuous yet irregular features uh, that have distinctive textures within the landscape. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the most important things uh, in creating an effective deep learning model is having a really good raster. Uh, we want a raster that emphasizes the textures of what we're trying to map. So if we're looking at mapping bedrock, we probably don't want to use satellite imagery unless we're in an area completely devoid of foliage. We also want something that doesn't really depend on aspect. So for example, I've shown a hillshade here. Uh, you can see we've got this nice stream that's cutting through some unconsolidated material. And that material is the same on both sides of that stream, but you can see on the west side of the image, it looks very dark and on the light side, it looks very bright. So we want to have some images that uh, don't have that effect. We want our, our raster to basically look the same no matter where you look. And on that note, we also would like to be able to apply these in a variety of locations. Um, so we have uh, a model that we've developed that um, basically can take a DEM and generate a uniform type of image. And if you've got a model you've trained in one area and you'd like to try it on another area, you can just uh, generate a DEM and, um, or generate a DEM derivative and run it in a different place. Uh, another original stipulation we had was that we needed to have a three band raster. Uh, this was an original limitation of the deep learning software we were using. Uh, fortunately, that's no longer a limitation, but um, this talk and most of my current work still focuses on using three bands because we found that to be very effective. So the first step in creating this three band raster is of course, acquiring a high resolution digital elevation model. Uh, this is one that I've downloaded from part of the Never Sink River watershed. Um, this is merely elevation. You can see that we can see some details. We can see hill slopes and valleys, uh, but that's about it. So first, uh, we want to create our red band. Now, this one is a topographic position index, or a TPI. Uh, this is calculated by taking the average elevation within 50 meters of a pixel and then subtracting that from the original DEM. The consequence of that is that we end up with a raster that has a mean value of about zero, uh, but then the high values, the positive values on that, show us topographic highs and the negative values show us uh, relative lows. So you can see that you know, our ridges are sort of washed out and then our valleys are those darker colors. You can also see that this really emphasizes the texture of the alluviated valleys uh, as well as these hill slopes. Next up, we take the square root of slope. Uh, now, you may be wondering why the square root of slope. We originally experimented with just using slope, but we found that in most areas, particular where, where we are mapping, the slope is pretty low. And so if we just use the, uh, the regular slope values from zero to 90 degrees, uh, we end up with a pretty uh, low contrast image, but if we take the square root, it really accentuates those differences at lower slope values. So uh, one consequence of that though, of course, is that our high slopes do end up looking a little bit washed out. Uh, fortunately, we still have a lot of information on those slopes from our other bands of the raster. And then our blue band is another TPI image. Now this one is actually done using an annulus. Uh, so it's got a two meter inner diameter a 10 meter outer diameter. But again, we're just taking that average elevation within that area and then uh, subtracting that from the raw DEM to get our local highs and lows. So you can see that really accentuates those beds in the bedrock. Uh, we can also really see nicely the boundaries of uh, hill slope materials where, where they meet the big alluvium filled valley. And uh, it, it really just helps pick out those fine textures. So when we combine all of those images together, we end up with the three band raster that we can train a model on. Uh, you can see here that we have a variety of very interesting and kind of psychedelic looking textures here. Uh, we've got this nice bedded hill slope, uh, very green and purple. Um, you can also see that, you know, we've got some fan material as we get closer to the valley. Uh, down in the valley, our alluvium has very distinctive textures. Uh, of course, water has its own distinctive texture, and uh, we, we basically see a lot of uh, very characteristic patterns for different materials 
um, that we wouldn't get otherwise just from a regular elevation raster. So when we have our raster, we then need to train a model. Um, essentially what we do is we have uh, shape files from pre-existing geologic maps that we uh, use to clip out that raster and uh, tell a model, you know, in areas where we have alluvium mapped, this is what alluvium looks like, bedrock looks like this, and um, we train models using the ArcGIS interface. Now, many folks who do deep learning have uh, long been using Python and R uh, to do this work. Uh, the approach that we've been using is a little more user-friendly. This is all done within ArcGIS Pro, uh, but using Python dependencies. Um, so it's you don't have to be a Python wizard to do this. Uh, as much as I have tried, I am not one, but this basically opens the door to doing a lot of different object detection and pixel classification um, processes. So um, for this example, we trained a model to identify 15 different types of materials, um, features in bedrock. I won't go through all of these, but broadly speaking, we were interested in mapping out alluvium versus colluvium. We we're also really interested in mapping out uh, glacial materials, as well as features like drumlins and mines and moraines, uh, in addition to mapping out where we have this bedrock. Uh, so on the right, you can actually see our training image here. Uh, this is a pretty large area, but in this area, you can see that we've got a lot of red. Uh, those are uh, urban areas that we trained. Uh, and then of course, we've got uh, yellow material, which is primarily uh, glacial material in this context. And then, uh, you know, you can see some gray for shale. And basically, we've got a lot of different uh, shape files that we fed into this from Pennsylvania, New York, and uh, the National Land Use Classification data set. So once we had these shape files and we had clipped our raster, uh, we fed these into a deep learning model. Uh, and so essentially what the model would do was it would look at the images we input um, and basically break them down pixel by pixel and identify different textures that correlated with different units. So for example, what alluvium looked like versus colluvium and what moraines looked like versus drumlins. And in the process of doing this, it reserved 10% of those shape files to assess accuracy. Um, so basically it would, it would train itself and then test itself on this reserved data set. And then once that accuracy uh, failed to increase significantly, it would stop training. So this one, ended up with about 70% accuracy. Training took 105 hours on my laptop, but fortunately we've upgraded our hardware a little bit. And uh, the overall classification process took only about four hours. So this is for mapping the whole Delaware River Basin, which you can see uh, in context to all these states is a very large area. Um, overall, we mapped out a lot of bedrock. We mapped out a lot of glacial material and urban areas. And then you can see there are some things that uh, we didn't really see that much of. You'll also notice that our coverage is a little bit lower down to the south, uh, save for being able to map out urban areas. And that's because uh, we didn't really have much training data at the time for these coastal materials that we were trying to map. Now, if we zoom in a little bit, this is a one to 100,000 sheet. Uh, this is the Papacton Reservoir. So this is uh, 30 minutes by 60 minutes. Uh, I've changed the color scheme a little bit to make things look a little more appealing here, but overall you can see again, we've got our bedrock and brown. Uh, here our glacial material is that sort of fuchsia pink color. And also we've got some other glacial materials mapped in cyan. And then of course we've got our alluvium in yellow. So you can see that at this rather coarse scale, uh, we have a pretty impressive looking map. And if we zoom in a little bit uh, to some uh, 7.5 minute quadrangles. I'm going to show you some more detail too. So these are the West Kill and the Hensonville quadrangles. Uh, if we look at those, you can see that we've got a pretty impressive level of resolution. So you can see we've mapped out bedrock very nicely. Um, we've got stratified drift and glacial materials uh, blanketing this uh, bedrock in many areas. You can also see that We've been able to map out alluvium as well as some small urban areas. Um, this isn't a very developed part of the watershed. Uh, and you can also see we've got drumlins mapped out. So we were pretty impressed with how well our model handled drumlins. If we look a little bit south, still north of that last glacial maximum line, uh, you can see that it's mapped out drumlin fields rather impressively. 
Um, there are some areas where you have some uh, sort of irregular looking drumlins. Uh, this is something we've been addressing with our current models, but overall we're very impressed with the, uh, the performance of this model for mapping out individual landforms such as drumlins. Now, when we go a little bit further to the south, we can see that uh, we're not mapping as much of the geomorphology and the surficial material. It's still doing a great job with the urban areas because it had a lot of training data for that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's kind of encouraging that our model is not trying to map things uh, that it hasn't been trained on. Uh, so for here, we're near Philadelphia. You can see that it's mapped out the extent of this urban area around a river park very nicely. Um, but it knows that it hasn't seen this sort of sediment yet, so it's not trying to map it. Uh, we did find that our model efficacy was strongly influenced by where we had training data and how distinctive these materials were. So of course, in the northern part, we're in a more mountainous area uh, compared to the coasts of the south. We also had more training data, so it was easier for the model to map out uh, things in that area. And so that's helped us develop new models that are more focused on physiographic provinces. Uh, we also think that model resolution and quality, uh, digital elevation model quality, has uh, influenced how our model performs in some areas. These are two areas that look pretty similar to us, but um, the model did well in one area and not so well in another. So that's something to consider. And uh, overall, we found that the abundance of training data we have really plays an important role in our model performance. Uh, so one thing we're doing is incorporating new data sets. Uh, we've got geologic maps from New Jersey and other areas. Um, we're incorporating more quaternary alluvium, ponds and lakes. And uh, we've found that that's really improved our model performance. So this is a model that I actually trained just about a month ago, um, less than that. And uh, you can see that we've got some really impressive performance. So on the left here, we've got part of the Delaware State Forest. Uh, you can see again, we've mapped out these drumlins and sort of that light blue. Um, we've got this field of uh, glacial drift and that darker blue. And you can see we've got some bedrock popping up around there, in addition to some alluvium and lakes. And just a little bit to the east in Fort Jervis, New York, uh, you can see that again, we've been able to map out bedrock really nicely, as well as alluvium and urban areas. Um, so with that, thank you for listening. And if you've got any questions, please feel free to contact me. Uh, you can email this email or uh, just look me up and uh, get in touch because I like talking about this stuff and introducing people to these techniques. Thank you.